You ready? <laughs> Okay. Howdy. Howdy. Oh, wow, well, that was not as enthusiastic <laughs> as it was on Friday afternoon. Let's try this one more time. Howdy. Howdy. All right, much better. I would guess that y'all have been up 48 hours or something like that. I can't believe something, you know, not as much energy. We tried to give you as much coffee and everything like that as we possibly could. Welcome to Aggie's Invent that's been focusing on our medical solutions this week. It's been a conjunction of the InMed program as well as our uh, undergraduate research group. So it's been a very interesting group of students and y'all have absolutely blown it out of the water this weekend. We've had 60 some odd students. We had 10 teams put this together. Y'all chose from 15 different need statements. You actually chose 10 to be working on and I personally have been amazed at the amount of innovation and the creativity that y'all have shown throughout this entire weekend. And I'm very excited to show what is actually going on and what y'all are going to be able to do. So it's really going to be outstanding. Now, there's gonna be 10 presentations. Each one of you will have 10 minutes. In the back, you'll see a timer back here. And while the timer shows 15 minutes right now, it's actually gonna show 10 minutes. 24 hour clock, it's 3 o'clock. Oh, ah, 24 hour clock, it's showing 3 o'clock. Perfect, now I got it. My <laughs> clock operator is smarter than me, which is not, uh, that's easy to do. That's beautiful. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, and oh, by the way, Russia got eliminated from the World Cup in case you didn't see it. Um, sad about that, kind of, because that would have been the first time the home country would have gotten into the World Cup, which would have been a uh, historic event. However, we've been concentrating on other things, although I have seen the World Cup go through here a couple of times. <laughs> uh, 90 seconds video is going to be in part of your presentation. It is going to be a judge presentation. We have a panel of four judges here that I'm going to get them to introduce themselves here in a few minutes. What we'll be doing is we'll get an opportunity to hear your presentations. They'll get an opportunity to ask questions for five minutes. I remind you, ten minutes. If it gets to zero, I will stop you mid-sentence, and then we'll move on, and I'll give everybody at least five minutes for questions. We'll then retire, and then we'll have a judges to get a chance to talk about it. Again, my name is Rodney Bain. I've had the pleasure of working with you throughout this entire weekend. It has been inspiring to see what y'all have come up with and what resources you've been able to use here, even though sometimes it's been a little bit frustrating. We've been able to work together, and I think you have come up and really, again, developed several things. I would like to remind you, since I am running entrepreneurship, that when you have an opportunity to take your idea and move it into a startup, if that's something that you would like to, we have an engineering incubator in our brand new building in Zachary, and we're, we're absolutely happy to support you. You'll have more access to free resources to start your company, to start your business, and to continue to push your idea than you ever will at any point in your career. So give us an opportunity to help you. Give us an opportunity to go on. If that's something that you'd like to do, contact me after this, and we will help you on continue this activity on. So. Without further ado, I'm going to ask our judges to introduce themselves to you so that you get a chance to meet them, and uh, then we'll start the presentations. If we can start over here, we'll get a chance to, to just say hello, who you are, and, and kind of how you're in, engaged in this. Hello, I'm Scott Wan. Um, I'm from the Mechanical Engineering Department. I do research in uh, rehabilitation, robotic, and robot system. Also, I'm a biomechanist. And um, yeah, so. I do many research and I also apply to human humans so that they uh, human actually they, they can walk better and they can balance that. All right, Jerry. My name is Nick Sears. Uh, I'm coming from Texas A&M Biomedical Engineering. Um, I did tissue engineering research, but I'm a new professor in the InMed program bringing in the engineering principles into the curriculum. I'm Victor Yukas, um, and the professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering here at Texas A&M. 
Uh, and uh, so my work uh, involves developing uh, miniaturized uh, devices for uh, biomedical analysis. I'm excited to, by see, seeing some of these need statements to see some of your solutions. Uh, and I've also been involved uh, sort of getting the NMED uh, program uh, launched. Uh, and also involved, we have a master's program in biotechnology that's a professional science master, so the students do sort of a hybrid science business curriculum. Uh, so uh, interested, excited to, to be a part of this and to see uh, what you have uh, been able to accomplish in the past uh, uh, 48 hours. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeremy Gibson. I'm from the College of Medicine. I'm the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, uh, also involved with uh, teaching roles within the College of Medicine. Uh, I'm a physician. I'm a pediatric hospitalist, which means I specialize in the care of uh, patients within the inpatient setting. And I submitted a couple of needs statements, and I'm excited to see if any of them <laughs> y'all chose and what you came up with. Okay, great. Without further ado, we're going to go to the first team, and it's hands up. <coughs> Howdy, my name is Anthony. I'm a junior manufacturing mechanical engineering technology major here at Texas A&M. Hi, I'm Maria Lidia. I'm a senior. I'm studying mechanical engineering at the University of Cyprus. Uh, we are a team. Hands, Hands up. up. And here is a short video for you to watch. Do you spend a lot of time at the computer? Do you cook often? Do you drive almost every day? I bet most of you do. Whether it's because of your daily activities or jobs, if the answers to the questions above are yes, then you have a higher risk of developing carpal tunnel syndrome. More than 8 million people are affected by it each year. Women are three times more likely than men to develop it. Carpal tunnel surgery is the second most common type of surgery performed. Carpal tunnel syndrome causes discomfort or pain in the wrists, palm, and even fingers due to the pressure on the median nerve in the wrist. A wrist brace or splint can help relieve the pain, but normally braces are uncomfortable and immobilize the wrist so people usually only wear it at night. That's where Hands Up comes in. The customizable supports have the perfect fit for each individual. Our gloves are lightweight with breathable materials so they can be worn comfortably for a long period of time. We have designed supportive gloves with hinges that allows more movement so you can still perform your daily activities and support your wrist. Go back to your daily activities without any discomfort with hands up. Don't let carpal tunnel syndrome stop you from living your life. And now I'll give it a little bit more information about carpal tunnel syndrome. So as was shown in the video, carpal tunnel syndrome is caused by constant stress on the median nerve. Um, it can lead to permanent muscle damage and loss of function in the hand. Some common symptoms of carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel syndrome are numbness and pain in the hand as shown in the diagram on the slide. Um, you're especially prone to carpal tunnel syndrome if you are like a waiter or you work in a machine shop and you use your wrist frequently. Um, some of the current treatments for carpal tunnel syndrome include uh, a wrist brace and as you can see it includes a metal um, stint in the hand so it completely immobilizes the wrist so it's hard to perform activities and it's very uncomfortable for the user. 
So a lot of times they'll just wear them at night and they don't wear them during the day and they'll have pain during the day. Um, then there's also steroid injections and you'll have to get these every so often. It will alleviate pain for a certain while but carpal tunnel syndrome can still reoccur after a while. And then surgery, a lot of these, the last two are very costly and a lot of elderly people don't want to get these types of treatments because they don't necessarily, they can handle the pain and they're on the pain medications, but it, they're uncomfortable and they don't want to undergo this type of treatment. And now Ashley will talk about the need statement. So our goal is to design a comfortable and supportive club that does not restrict any everyday activities for the patients while also providing a, an efficient support and pain relief. <coughs> So as um, Anthony mentions before, the traditional braces are very uncomfortable because they restrict the wrist completely. So we don't want that. So we design our gloves to be able to not restrict any the range of moment, the range of movement motion of the wrist. Sorry about that. And then also the braces are not customizable. So we also design our gloves to be customizable and also patient specific. So they are made for each individual use. Um, also, while being at an affordable cost, cannot forget about that. <laughs> and also, um, the traditional braces, because of the restriction on the wrist that they made the patients very uncomfortable, so they don't wear it use during daytime, so they only use it during nighttime. So we also design our gloves to be comfortable and suitable so the patient can use it during the daytime for a long period of time. I'm going to pass to Raghu, who's going to talk about our um, design considerations. Uh, the first design that we looked at was something like an exoskeleton for the wrist, where elastic bands attach to the fingers, and then they attach to the wrist on each side. So then these pull the wrist to a neutral position at all times. But we thought this might put too much pressure on the wrist, so we didn't go with this design. Another design what, that we considered was to have plates around the wrist, and have something like a tourniquet that the user can adjust so that they can uh, tighten it based on how much pain they feel. But the design that we finally landed on was uh, this hinge design, where we have hinges on the top and the bottom of the wrist with torsion springs for the hinges. So the, these hinges uh, push the wrist to its neutral position at all times, so there's support. But you can still move your wrist, so that's where you get the, you, you'll be able to perform your activities. The way we went about doing this was first we uh, scanned a hand with a 3D scanner, and with that CAD model, we then designed a plate that contoured to the hand, so it fit comfortably on the hand, and then we attached the uh, torsion spring between the plates, and now I'm going to hand it over to Melanie, who's going to talk about how we assembled the final product. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the We're missing a slide, sorry. Um, so we made it with neoprene and then stitched in a layer of moisture wicking material. And we use neoprene because it's durable and it's flexible and it's also comfortable. And then we use the moisture wicking material inside to keep your hand cool and dry throughout the day. And so then we sewed pockets between these two layers of fabric and inserted the 3D printed hinges so that they would be there to support the wrist. Then, in order to make it more adjustable, we put a nylon strap with a Velcro closure so that it will be able to be adjusted. And then we, um, we designed it so that it would be more feasible to be used because it's made with 3D printed plastic, which is really accessible and more cheap every day. And it's also made out of materials that are readily available, like the neoprene and the moisture wicking material. And then we also thought it would be more feasible because it's a, a glove design, so it's slip-on and it's comfortable and it's easy to use. And it also can be hand washed. And now over to Meryl for the future developments. Okay, uh, in the future we're thinking of improving this, our device, by adding uh, by using the plates uh, printed 3D, 3D printed with nylon instead of PLA, which is what we have now, so it's more flexible and a little bit softer on the skin, but still providing the support you need. We also can add hinges on the sides of the wrist instead of the front and the back to um, prevent, or not prevent, to support the wrist in this direction too. 
we also thought about having choices of spring uh, with different spring uh, coefficients. So with different strengths, depending on the severity of the condition, as prescribed by a doctor, you can have some that's really strong so you cannot move that much or make it more flexible so you have more movement, more freedom, but still have the support. And we also thought about cutting the fabric <coughs> to a honeycomb pattern to allow for more coolness and readability in the, in the fabric. Some other applications of our product here, we can use it as not only as a treatment, but also as a preventative method, so you're less likely to develop carpal tunnel syndrome. And it can also be used as a personal protective equipment since it's considering that assembly line workers are three times more likely to develop carpal tunnel syndrome than data entry workers. So it can be used as a safety gear for them. And that is all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you. We have five minutes for questions. Uh, first off, I'd say that uh, that I think you you I defined the problem quite well. Um, so what you were able to capture within that, I was thinking as you presented, uh, how do you envision this customization process? I mean, who has ownership of that in in this process? I mean, y'all mentioned as far as the physician taking the role. I'm assuming of the diagnosis, and ultimately maybe judging a level of severity to determine how much restriction of movement they would have, but. How would it proceed from there? So we were, we were envisioning something like the 3D scanner is located at the hospital with the physician who, who decides uh, how stiff the spring needs to be and then scans the patient's wrist. And then we get the file. And once we have the file, developing the plates is uh, simple. Mm -hmm. We can develop it, print it, and then send it back to the physician who then gives it to the patient. Okay. One element I was thinking of is that if you made it where some of these adjustments could be made gradually over time uh, by being able to uh, modify the, the degree of flexibility, uh, I could probably envision that a physical therapist would probably have the role in monitoring that moving forward as part of a rehabilitation process. Yeah, so uh, we, were, we were also thinking about having so these 3D printed parts, because uh, once you have the design, as they, they are becoming relatively uh, cheap to print. So we could have multiple printed hinges mm -hmm. with different stiffness springs mm -hmm. that you can swap out as you go through your physical therapy. Okay, so that you would probably awesome. complete a whole mm -hmm. series of variable, okay, uh, got it. Not to naysay 3D printing, that's what I did in my research. I try to use it as much as possible, but it, it may not be necessary for the base unit. You know, it may just be something you need to add for special cases, special anatomy or something. But what, what do you think maybe about some feedback? Something, how, how can you, other than the patient, uh, saying, oh, it feels better, uh, what kind of, can you think of any sensors or something that might be helpful to confirm or measure, you know, that you're making an improvement? Uh, uh, for now, I think we are relying on the pain measures mm -hmm. that the patient feels. Uh, because uh, as far as I'm aware, we do not we do not have any sensor that can accurately measure pain. Yeah. We are relying on the user to tell us what level of pain they feel. Uh, so no, we did not we do not envision any sensors in the device. Okay, I can get their like range of motion possibly that, and yeah. see how it changes over time with the use of the um, support glove. Yeah, be a good idea. Yeah, following up on that, I had a similar thought, you know, like you can buy a thing for like your posture, for example, you wear the sensor and then when you, you know, surpass a certain angle, bend over, it'll vibrate. So I could mm -hmm. imagine maybe something that uh, could help a user maintain a healthy range of motion. Mm -hmm. That's why we like the spring because it promotes like good posture. So when you're not using it, it's going to return back to the neutral position. That's why we have hinges on both sides. It's why we still want the wrist to be able to move, but then because of the spring, it's naturally going to come back to the neutral position, which is which is what we think our device is designed to do. I guess another question following up on some of them about the, the 3D printing. So it seems like you're, from the scanning and printing, that deals mainly with the plate, Yeah. and then the spring is a standard or selected from some library. Well, we just use a dodging spring from a clothes pin. Yeah. But uh, when we actually make a product, we, we think we'll be able to have defined uh, characteristics for the spring 
and make it specifically for the patient instead of having to just take it off of a close patient. Right. Okay. I guess I'm getting, you know, is the 3D printing really necessary in oh, the sense of what? Yeah. The I mean, the, the scanning, the so customization. It makes it uh, more comfortable since it conforms to your hand, since like everyone has different hand structures. By having the 3D print, it allows it to be more comfortable because like the splints right now, it's just like a straight metal rod. So it can get very uncomfortable, and especially if you're like moving it. So by having the 3D printed part, it conforms to your um, topography of your skin and your bone okay. structure. So it's not just a flat plate. Uh, yeah, no. it's okay, I understand. Yeah. And, and that's a common complaint with the current ones. Is that it it just makes it so that your hand is immobile. If you have the metal splint, then you can't be typing or, or cooking or whatever you your daily activities that use the motion of your wrists. Can we, can we see it? Are you uh, able to pass it around? You. Yeah, so, you can, but we are out of time. Oh. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, see you at the break. Okay, cool. okay thank you very much. And I give you F Shift Audio. Afternoon, everybody. This is F Shift Audio. I'm Jonathan Tilly. I'm a graduate mechanical engineer. I'm Carl Stowar. I'm a Master's of Engineering student at the uh, Biomedical Engineering Department. I'm Paul Nicker. I'm an in med student here at Texas A&M. Anthony was happily uh, a senior aerospace engineering major. John Kyle Cooper, a senior biomedical engineering major. We're F Shift Audio. may be caused by a number of factors, including genetics, aging, exposure to noise, and some infections. Do you know someone who has experienced hearing loss? According to World Health Organization, 5% of the world population, or 466 million people, have disabling hearing loss. This includes 432 million adults and 34 million children. Hearing loss is one of the most common conditions affecting older and elderly adults. One in three people between the ages of 65 and above experience hearing loss. In the future, hearing loss is prone to affect one in 10 people globally. Hearing loss proves difficult to understand and follow the doctor's advice responding to warnings, doorbells, and alarms. This makes it hard to enjoy talking with friends and family, 
where this can be frustrating, embarrassing, and even dangerous. Yet only 33% of people who suffer from hearing loss seek proper treatment. Why is this the case? Most hearing aid devices don't satisfy customers because they are bulky, expensive, time-consuming, and unadapted to the patient's needs. This is F-Shift Audio, and we make hearing easier. So to continue on to that, there's three different types of hearing loss. We have conductive, which is mostly in the canal, the sensorial and neural, mostly for loss in hair loss, the hair loss inside the ear, and also the combination between the two. When one goes through a hearing loss, they go through a traditional route to get examination. So the first one's a physical examination, and then we have the cure tone test, where they go through a soundproof barrier and go into earphones and be able to listen to the type of tones that they hear. Now, at the end result, you get an audiogram, which is the combination of all these results from these tests. Now, for the audiogram, this shows two lines, a left ear and a right ear. This explains how when you are able to listen to a, any type of audio, you will need to hear it louder. Now, the vertical axis is the decibels. The lower you get, the higher you need to hear and the horizontal axis represents the auditorial spectrum of a human. Now, well, our device is going to streamline this entire traditional process so it's much easier for the patient, time money, for time and money. Now, how are we doing this? We gathered five requirements where we want it to be comfortable, mobile, easy to use, visibly discreet, and also, of course, for the patient to be able to hear clearly. All right, so I'm gonna walk you guys basically through a high level functional uh, diagram of what our device is actually doing. So of course the patient needs to have the device and has to turn it on. Uh, right after that, the first thing that will happen will be an auto calibration step that will determine the patient's own uh, audiogram. Uh, the device will then after that uh, map the, the input uh, um, audio frequencies from the environment uh, will be mapped into the patient's own generated audiogram so that the patient can personally hear all the, all the sounds that are in the environment. Uh, after that, the algorithm will also uh, perform some adaptive uh, filtering to remove additional noise, and then the patient will be able to listen uh, normally. Uh, so as you can see on the right, that is a picture of the prototype that we have on the uh, table. Uh, Cole will uh, explain to you uh, what it actually does. Uh, now, in the next uh, slide, before we move ahead, uh, we're going to show you a demo of our calibration algorithm. And so all we want to really show you is the interaction between the program and the user. Uh, the way this actually works is that the program will actually sweep through a variety of tones, uh, incre incremental frequencies, and different loudness levels. And so the user will only have to uh, press a key on the keyboard in this case because uh, we have it uh, optimated for the computer right now. Um, <laughs> and that's basically how the program takes the input. And so go ahead. So this is a MATLAB, and you'll see me... Please make it. sure you are in a quiet area. This test is about to begin. First sound coming up. Are you ready? You can see the output frequency on the screen. Okay, we will increase the loudness. Are you ready? First of all, if this wasn't clear, our product is a hearing aid. Um, so I'm going to go over the uh, implementation of our prototypes. What, I, what we did as a team was we um, used a desktop microphone, biased it, and amplified it so that we could detect the vocal tones and environmental noise. That is being input into an FPGA integrated microprocessor, which is performing a time domain uh, frequency shift, which and that frequency shift and the gain profile are both customizable through a graphical user, user interface. Um, in the next video, I'm going to show you kind of a demo of what that sounds like and looks like. This is a test recording of 20% pitch shift. This is a test recording of 10% pitch increase. Before we move on, I just want to emphasize that this is done in real time. There's a, about a 60 millisecond delay, um, which is within uh, underneath the delay that's uh, that's unreasonable for people to use in real time. Um, these choices were not 
trivial either. We implemented it into an FPGA, the, the processing and the sampling, because it allows for the miniaturization required to put it into an earworn uh, earpiece. All right, let's look at like what exactly the person who's using the hearing aids actually use. So our app basically starts off by a calibration process. The, so the, uh, the person all had, all the person has to do is just press the button of calibration and it will go to our um, audi uh, audiologist AI and it will be uh, working with that to kind of like test, uh, go through different tests. So all it has to do is press, uh, click on one of those buttons and every time it hears something, it clicks on it and every time it doesn't, it just, um, it just doesn't click on anything else. All right, so a couple of app features that we're trying to implement is uh, Bluetooth capability. So it's able to connect to different types of devices like your tablet devices, your, uh, your phones, and uh, anything in between. Also, it's gonna have a geota uh, geotagging feature as well. So uh, based on the location that you are at, the, the device will calibrate based on the different uh, modes of uh, uh, the noise uh, what the software decides based on the noise levels of the environment. Um, all right, so our business plan is a two-phase approach. So one of the main things that we realized is both uh, the, the, the normal hear, uh, earbud markets and the hearing aid markets are looking for adaptive noise cancellation. So basically it goes from one place to another and it would have uh, uh, the, the software will correct based on different environments. So we, our first phase is to make a mass uh, mass uh, market product, which is just earbuds in general, and we'd use that revenue to uh, try to fund us through the FDA process. Uh. So we want to cut out the audiologist entirely, and this saves money, and it's more convenient, and it saves a trip to the audiologist. Furthermore, we have Bluetooth technology integrated into our device. Now, current devices don't all have Bluetooth connection, and some of them that do don't connect to every device. So for our device, we hope to connect universally to every device, and also in the future, many more devices that will be created using this technology. Furthermore, we have adaptive noise cancellation technology that will adapt to any environment. And um, the unique thing about our startup is our, our two-phase business plan, where we start with the massive crowd pre-FDA, and then we go to FDA afterwards. And so for our future work, right now we have a 16-bit processing power. And with current uh, processing technology and the further development, we hope to increase that processing to 64-bit, which will increase the resolution of the voice encoding and the sound encoding for our technology. Also, we would like to use deep learning to work with our adaptive noise canceling environment to further um, anticipate what might be around. We can use the data from all people around using these hearing aids, and we can create something that we might not have even anticipated. And we also want to utilize uh, the technology that's further being developed right now is thermal power. And that will allow us to shrink down the battery size and it will make it more convenient, more portable. And furthermore, we lastly, actually, tonight is canceling. So one of the biggest problems that I've heard, and also it's amongst elderly people, is tinnitus, which is a constant ringing in the ear. And current technology and our technology will allow uh, us to cancel out this noise because it's just a simple canceling. So. Thank you. And do you have any questions? Perfect. If any of the judges would like to demo the microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the time. And you're welcome to demo as well. So um, in, in the last slide, actually, you mentioned that you can use like a really good uh, computation performance. And so that means uh, your size will be bigger. It gets bigger, right? So do you have any ideas about how small your device can be? So. Um, the processor with integrated FPGA that we implemented here is um, That's my real, right? I'm sorry? Is it my real? It's my real, but the, the processor itself, which would be performing the computations, is about nine millimeters by nine millimeters. Um, but we don't need to use this uh, powerful of a processor or this size of an FPGA, and there are processors that are down to about 25 square millimeters. Not only that battery as well, we have to take care of consideration. I guess well, this is something that's always uh, interested me. Is like what what uh, you know what is the main barrier why hearing aids don't work better currently? Is it they can't be made small enough? Is it they need too much battery consumption? What is the why why aren't people doing this already with the technology that we have? Well, two things. First of all, there's some market influences that. Uh, 
result in perhaps slow development for these uh, earpieces. So they're, um, right now, most of the hearing aids are prescription. So they are FDA, uh, they're considered uh, FDA devices and with a set of protocols that they have to continue the development on. So a lot of them stick to a very strict set of functionality because that set of functionality allows them to get approved in a more rapid process for a lot less money. Um, the other thing is power consumption. Um, these devices have to last all day. And power consumption up until the last even 10 years has been the major barrier. But now as the battery um, and charging technologies have improved and there's some novel charging technologies that we've addressed here, that is going to uh, be addressed. I would suggest, you know, you mentioned um you know, visibility or the size, maybe uh, some more, you might consider looking at that some more, because I mean, today people are wearing, you know, earbuds, uh, things already. Uh, if the device really works that much better, maybe they wouldn't mind a larger uh, sized uh, device. So a lot of these, uh, not necessarily the uh, earbuds, but a lot of these Bluetooth earbuds that are coming out that are popular and that are used and that are, are um, to a degree, uh, considered just almost fashionable. They, they are larger and they do incorporate uh, microprocessors as well. Uh, There's also common examples too to where they would have a hard time trying to connect to Bluetooth to many devices. Most of the devices they connect to is just the phone itself. They can't be able to connect to either a computer or, or a television from what we were experiencing from the research that we saw. It all depends on the Bluetooth technology. Correct. And why that might be important is we would hope that this device can be used in multiple ways. It can be used as a standard Bluetooth earbud, and it can also pitch shift those tones as well. You, um, you guys mentioned uh, kind of obviating the need for an audiologist. I, I'm just uh, want a little clarification on on what that statement is. I'm, I'm, you're marketing to people just in recognizing their own noticeable. Um, uh, poor hearing loss and what what would be then the threshold for seeking medical care and making sure that this isn't something that would require you know further uh, intervention well like any care it's up to the patient to decide whether or not they want to see a physician as we discussed only 33 percent of patients seek proper care to begin with um, so keep that in mind but uh, the one of the most common causes of hearing loss is geriatric hearing loss which is just an inability to hear these higher frequencies, and a lot of people get that, and they recognize it. Some people, it's worse than others, and when it becomes pathologic, where they're having trouble functioning every day, that's when they might want to see an audiologist. We hope to intervene at that point where they're considering to see an audiologist, because we hope that our device can save them the trip. I just think that's a key element. I mean, is in the intentionality, you're providing something that you, people think is just a solution to their problem, but remember, hearing loss is a symptom, right? So mm -hmm. remembering that who your target groups may be, you're saying primarily the geriatric, you know, population, and making sure that there wouldn't be risk factors incurred from missing something there. Again, this is a symptom. Well, to emphasize, before we are going to market our device as a audiology, like as a device that can be used for patients who have pathologic uh, issues with hearing, we want to market a device uh, we'll outside of that realm. We won't be claiming that it treats anything. Correct. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um. In the next group, a smooth transition.
Okay, take it away. Hi, we are Smooth Transitions. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Allers. I'm a chemical engineer at UNM, and I'll be a senior this year. Yeah, my name is Hunter Tellev. I'm studying mechanical and energy engineering at the University of North Texas. I'll be a senior. Hi, my name is Martin Kahl. I'm studying industrial distribution at Texas A&M, and I'll be a senior. My name is Kyle Keane. I study mechanical engineering at Bradley University in Illinois, and I'm a senior as well. Hello, I'm Nathan Blackman. I'm a senior mechanical engineer at UT Dallas. Hi, I'm Mario Mendoza. I'm a senior nuclear engineer major here at A&M. So currently in hospitals around the country, doctors and nurses face quite a bit of a challenge. After surgery, doctors and nurses must transition the patients to the hospital beds in order to move them to the recovery area. Currently, this process can be challenging, risky, and somewhat dangerous. Currently, they use blankets and four or five people to try to move the patient onto the hospital bed from the operation table. We were task, tasked with the, to make a solution to make that process easier, and we came up with a design. Our requirements are that our design must be able to hold around 450 pounds. We researched that standard hospital beds, their maximum weight capacity is 450 pounds. Our design must also minimize movement to the patient since they just had surgery. We do not want to mess with any stitches, sutures, or make them need to go through surgery again. Another requirement is that the process must save time and energy. Our method that we designed must be at least just as long or quicker than the current method, or else why would we do it? And it must save the energy and effort from doctors and nurses, who would take less people and less of an effort. Also, our design must be able to be cleaned and sanitized because it will be in the operation theater and we don't, don't want the patients to get infected. And lastly, it must be cost effective so that many hospitals around the nation can implement our method. And here's a little pitch. Go ahead and set me up a second line. I'm showing injury to his chest. Sir, can you hear me at all? A surgery is successful, doctor. But we need to move the patient to the recovery area now. You're right. Get the nurses. Don't you just hate it when you drop a patient? Hi, I'm Kyle King with Smooth Transitions. Now, maybe dropping a patient doesn't happen very often, but the transition from operating table to hospital bed can be a risky and cumbersome one. As you can see, this process can be dangerous for the patient because of the movement that they endure, but also difficult for the nurses, especially if the patient is overweight. Here at Smooth Transitions, we've developed a product to greatly improve the transitioning of a patient. Let's look at a model. As you can see here, our design allows for the operation table and hospital bed to slide in between the frame to deposit and retrieve the patient respectively using the lifting technology already existing on the operation table and hospital bed. A canvas material will be used to slide into the arms of our hanger to suspend the patient comfortably while the operation table or hospital bed is being replaced by one or the other. The hanger can also be easily folded and stored for the saving of space. All right, now we're going to do a demonstration of our model. We have a little concept prototype. This is just a flow chart uh, showing the uh, how it's done. So after surgery, the patient will be already on the canvas that we have prototyped and then uh, so they're on the operating table and then they come up to our product. Can you move that end? It's sliding. Yeah. Then they are slid onto our product as shown and over here we have end caps uh, that snap onto the arms just for more stability. The operating table is then slid out and the patient is 
uh, safely hanging there with minimal movement. Next, the hospital bed is brought in. And once again, the operating table and hospital bed are utilizing the hydraulics that they already have to move the patient up and down. So now the hospital bed will be raised up and will grab the patient and then can slide out comfortably and then they will return to their room. Now going into some of the materials we used. Okay, so for the canvas, we're looking at a sort of a nylon material, nylon six specifically. Uh, for the dimensions, we were thinking approximately seven by five feet. Um, so standard hospital beds are seven by three, and we wanted to give a couple extra feet on the edge to account for the sleeves that the arms go into, and also just so that it lays comfortably on the bed. Uh, in looking at the material, we also considered polypropylene, just because of how uh, cheap it is. Um, but looking, comparing tensile strength and flexural strength, uh, we decided to go with nylon. Also, if you look at the fatigue of uh, pro polypropylene, uh, they, it was tested at 10 megapascals, and it survived the same amount of cycles, but nylon was tested at 22 megapascals, so we, we feel like the nylon would last a lot, a lot longer. Um, even though they won't be undergoing that sort of stress on a daily basis. Uh, another one of the things is polypropylene is very flammable and we didn't want to have a high risk material like that inside the operating room uh, just in case there was any uh, open flame. Uh, the one thing about nylon is that it is acid dried so it can't be mixed with bleach after it's formed um, so that's something to keep in con to consideration. Alright, so the frames, dimensions, the length, and the width will primarily be uh, governed by the dimensions of the canvas, uh, which was already covered by seven, uh, roughly seven by four. The height was our main uh, area of concern, because uh, in about 2.75 feet was the ideal uh, window where you could sort of have the hospital bed and the surgical table. Uh, that sort of exists right in that window to allow them both to uh, operate in that area and use the hydraulics for the implemented devices instead of uh, implementing any other hydraulics into our system. Uh, material will primarily be uh, type 316 stainless steel. Uh, this was chosen for sanitation reasons, uh, which we can wipe down the uh, stainless steel with distilled water and mild soap. Uh, and then sanitized with isopropyl alcohol, which is what's used for typical surgical equipment. The <coughs> canvas uh, will be thrown in, can be thrown in with the other bedding and sheeting. Uh, CDC uh, had a study that showed that uh, only about a very small amount of risk came from um, textiles and other uh, bedding material. Um, and the only problem, of course, like you said, is the bleaching, so it will probably have to be wiped down with the isopropyl alcohol for sanitation. So the, as you saw in the video, the current method is very cumbersome. It requires a lot of staff, and there's a lot more risk. And you know, you have to lift the patient up. So if they just underwent surgery, there's some maybe other kinds of injuries that you can induce. So using our method, we want to the, some of the features that you can have is you have less staff that you, that are required to operate it. Um, in the design, we also opened up some of the legs so that as you're sliding the beds in, they kind of will help align on the poles here. And then the back hinges behind the material, um, on the back of the model, can fold up to about a third of their width. So with that, um, in the operating room, their space is a very, is very um, is a big necessity, but it's not very uh, abundant. So being able to fold it up helps save a little. And then some of the other feature designs uh, that we wanted to implement is wanted to add more parts so if we separated the parts more we could have looked more at the material um, and see the weight and the cost that comes with it and even simulate some of the loads where if we keep taking away material we can also test it for heavier patients and then I'll give it back to Kyle for the summary so just some things that we uh, utilize so the technology that is already in the hospital such as the operating uh, tables as well as the hospital beds already have the hydraulics so um, our product can be implemented right away uh, with all the already existing technology in hospitals. Um, also, um, 
there's a reduced risk for the patient uh, because there's so much less movement um, from the operational table to the hospital bed. And finally, it also eliminates. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Your time is up. Judges, y'all have five minutes for questions. Okay. I guess uh, I'm trying to picture the workflow again a little more because so this yeah. this uh, surface is on the surgical table. Yes. Under so, the patient. Okay, so you're dealing with transferring the patient after the surgery mm -hmm. uh, has been completed. Is there any um, any constraint? I guess in terms of how this is done currently, uh, I guess if they're lifted, is there some need to remove then the canvas that they're on during the surgery? Would that maybe have some uh, some uh, Know, contamination or things that need to be cleaned uh, right. have you thought about that yeah so from everything we've seen um, the, how they do it now they lift them with the sheets that they're already on to put on the hospital bed and then they leave them on there to go to the recovery room and then after they've recovered for a little bit they take the sheets off and wash them so we're assuming that we can leave this on with the other sheets um, and then it'll be washed with all the other sheets when they take them off there okay. was an idea for taking out one of these uh, and then having a crank essentially on the other side. You could actually roll it, drag it out from under them if it was. Uh, so then the only rigid part of this is that end piece then? And yeah, the, it's just this. Uh, and okay. this comes okay. out too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And that's add more support and make it more like a cot so that it doesn't uh, kind of like fold at the end. Initially we didn't have that and the very end would fold and the patient would kind of sink down. So having that end piece yeah, allows Yeah, it's just like a blanket. Oh, okay. with yeah. sleeves on the side. Okay, I understand. Yeah. My biggest worry is those rods sticking out. That mm. just looks like a real, I, I mean, I saw some of the, the simulations. Can you do anything to convince me that that's not going to break or at least bend over time? And how are you going to mitigate that? I guess? Another idea that we had, uh, we weren't able to implement in the time that we were allotted, but we were, uh, had an idea for something in here, a leg that would extend you could fold down and lock it in place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's mainly a consideration of the material that we use, stainless steel or maybe something else. Like we said in future work, we wanted to more test the tensile strength of this material, the torsion, and the shear stress to really see uh, what material we need to use to be able to hold that much weight at that angle. Did you take into consideration the size of your device and the typical operating theater size? Uh, yeah, operating the uh, theaters are not that big, as we said, there's not a lot of space. So that's why we, and um, well, our frame has to be at least seven feet long to accommodate tall patients and these operating tables and beds. So the best way we can mitigate that is designing it to fold up to a third of its width and maybe having it next to a wall somewhere in the operating table. Personally, I've never been a surgeon, so I don't really know everything that's in the operating theater. Can you think of another way that the device might fit better and not have that long arm still accomplish the same thing? We considered removing the arms, but by doing that, we would remove some of the strength at the joint. It would be better if they were welded together, because if we had a slot, it wouldn't hold as much weight on it. So that, that was a consideration that we have to kind of sacrifice in order to support that weight. Also, instead of folding up, you could fold it back and maybe slide it under the table. And then maybe from the side, instead of the, the short side, instead of the long side, right. however you're... Because right. then you'd have shorter arms and... Well, the problem with that was with patients with back surgery, we didn't want them to fold at all. Okay. So if we, if we could make sure it was stiff enough, then yes, that would work. But okay. A real theoretical, I guess, if we've got a second, is just if what if the patient becomes unstable during the period of time when you're trying to make these types of transfers? Because the other types of transfers are pretty much a single motion, even though it requires multiple people. In mm -hmm. that. So you're going to be having a change in that transition time, if I'm understanding you correctly. Well, ideally, it would happen as fast or even faster than our demo right here. Mm -hmm. We ideally would have the patient on the operation table and the hospital bed right next to each other in the same room 
and make that transition quickly. Also, I, ideally, after surgery, the patient is stable, and that's why we're moving them to recovery, right? But theoretical, of course, yeah, like, uh, it would be as, as quick as we just That's did. where I think maybe the possibility of having some alternative on this end from just those free hanging arms might be taken into consideration that if there was something that moved into place until the other bed was in, at least you would have a, a device that was stable enough that potentially if you had to do some yeah. sort of staged stabilization before you made the actual transfer. Yeah, of course. And then we mentioned those swinging arms that would allow more stabilization. Okay, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, judges. Our next team is Quick Draw. Hi, so I'm John Slater. I'm a master's student in biomedical engineering. I'm Scott Wellborn, and I'm part of the InMed program. I'm Maria Rao, and I'm a senior biomedical engineering major. I'm Kevin Patel. I'm a graduate student in the electrical engineering department. I'm Audrey Hoff. I'm a junior chemi major. I'm Gabby Smith. I'm a junior mechanical engineering major, and we are Quick Draw. We've all been there. You're at the doctor's office, and they tell you you need to have your blood drawn for testing. Having your blood drawn is extremely uncomfortable, especially for children, and it can take a very long time depending on how many vials one needs. Most blood tests require four to six vials of blood, but in certain situations, more tests are required. During pregnancy, sometimes 10 or more vials are needed. Not only is the process stressful for most patients, it's also a very difficult task for the nurse that requires their utmost care and attention. If you're a nurse, you've surely dealt with attempting to draw multiple vials of blood from a squirming child. Or maybe you've dealt with taking a dozen vials of blood from a pregnant woman. The fact is, it can be very difficult for the nurse to hold the needle completely still while the vial fills with blood, and then replacing the vials as they fill up is clumsy and awkward. There's got to be a better way. And there is. The proposed solution is called Quick Draw, an automated vial replacer that does the work for the nurse. Quick Draw is a revolutionary blood collection system that increases the speed and ease of drawing blood. Let's take a closer look. It works by integrating the blood collection equipment through a rotating wheel that holds multiple vials. After the needle is inserted into the patient, the device is activated with the simple push of a button. The needle penetrates the current vial, quick draw senses when it's full, and automatically removes the needle, allowing the wheel to rotate and align to the next vial. This system greatly increases the speed and ease of collecting multiple vials of blood. With quick draw, we can't make it hurt less, but we can make it hurt quicker. As you can see from the video, um, there is a need for a more efficient method for blood sample collection. What's current, the method that is currently used is a double-ended needle with a plastic sheath in the middle. One end is inserted into the patient's arm and the other is used to puncture the rubber cap on a um, vacutainer. Now a vacutainer is just a blood vial used for sample collection. Now, the, there's a negative pressure caused by the vacuum in the vacutainer that draws the blood through. Once the vial is nearly full, uh, once the vial is nearly full, uh, blood 
there's no more pressure difference and blood is then collecting. A huge issue with this is that um, it needs to be very still while the nurse is doing it. And also it's very cumbersome to switch between vacutainers. Um, especially since a lot of times a lot of vacutainers are needed. So the design requirements include being able to fill up multiple vials without constantly manually replacing them. It should also be, the method should also be a process that's quicker than the current method. They should be able to be operated by a single person, such as a nurse or a phlebotomist that will be using the device. And of course, it needs to be blood compatible and sterilizable. But most importantly, it also needs to be as cheap or cheaper than the current device, or else why would they buy them? So what we initially came up with, it's not actually shown on the slide, was a branch type of or vial device that had one intermediary tube with like four or however many vials needed. Um, a common problem with that that we found was that it would be hard to evenly fill the vials. Um, also, it'd be hard to customize how many vials you need per device. So that led to the Lego design, which is shown, and that's one intermediary tube in a link of vials. Um, the point of that was to fill from bottom to top with blood, and once they were done being filled, you could detach them like Legos. Uh, a common problem with that, though, was maintaining the negative pressure within each vial. That would require a whole new type of vial, which um, would ultimately lead to a complete overhaul of blood testing, such as centrifuging, which hospitals would most likely not want to invest in. Um, another problem with the Lego design was keeping the chemical coating from the top vial from flowing in the blood all the way to the bottom vial. So we realized a major challenge we had to address was keeping the vials separated. So that's what led us to the wheel design where all of the vials are separated in the wheel, which Scott will explain. Okay, as seen in the video, we are implementing a rotating platform that serves as a housing for each of your different vials. And in order to maintain sort of a small compact device, we are also, while having the necessary number of vials in order to carry out all of your blood tests, we are estimating that a number of 10 vials will be suitable. Um, and because this device is entirely automated, the nurse will press one button and then the entire uh, process will be carried out. So I'll do a short demonstration real quick just to, uh, just to see how this works. So Kevin and Audrey are gonna help me. This is a small blood collecting butterfly needle which will be inserted into Audrey's vein and then blood will flow from here through the connecting tubes to this lower, uh, this lower needle which is connected to um, this pump right here. This is um, ideally, it's a linear actuator that's controlled by the electronic system. But just for the purposes of our demonstration, we just have a spring activated pump that moves up and down like this. And then also beneath we have a simple set of motor, sy a simple motor system that enables the rotation. And through this entire fully automated system, we are able to detect whether or not the vials are filled completely or if they're empty we're able to rotate it and we're able to collect blood within each of the vials. And Kevin's gonna elaborate a little more on the process. Um, so with our device, as Scott mentioned, we're utilizing three devices. An IR sensor that's placed directly near the vial, a linear actuator in the center that actually does the pumping, and a stepper motor that rotates the platform. So our control system is basically set up, shown on the flowchart, so we have an IR sensor that basically detects whether a vial is empty. Once it realizes the vial is empty, a linear actuator descends into the vial, so it will start drawing blood. Once the IR sensor then detects the vial is full, the linear actuator will ascend, and then it will signal the motor to keep rotating in until all the vials are completed. Once the IR sensor realizes that a vial isn't actually placed, it will turn off the system as all the blood needed to be collected, as we've collected all the blood needed. All right, so um, unlike the uh, traditional um, blood collection systems on the market now that have the double-sided needle and the plastic um, sheath between them, ours is going to utilize that long uh, tubing between the needle that collects the blood and the actual quick draw system. And so what this means for our market is that we are going to um, sell us our own custom tubing and needles to be uh, sold additionally along with the quick draw system. And um, however, we're, we're going to use the standard vacutainers that are on the market currently in order to um, allow for a more smooth transition into hospitals that will have blood testing equipment that utilizes those st um, standard vacutainers. And so um, some fur 
some further considerations for this technology would be uh, possibly lowering the amount of automation in the device to find the right balance between affordability and uh, convenience. We could potentially have the device require more button pushes and uh, not utilize a sensor if it means that it would be more affordable to a larger market size. And um, so we would, we would explore this and, uh, you know, market it to smaller hospitals and specialty clinics first to find that right balance that we could do cost analysis on and find the ideal amount of uh, automation. And then we will um, also, we have a, a more of a um, convenience driven value proposition rather than cost driven since most hospitals don't have a big problem with uh, user error in regards to blood drawing. It's not that common. So what we're mainly pitching to the hospitals is that this would be, this would make the life of your nurses and phlebotomists much easier as well as provide more comfort to the patient by making the procedure faster. And so in summary, our device, uh, you, it presents a novel way to fill multiple containers with blood like in a more uh, efficient manner and it can easily be operated by one nurse and it uh, will be fully op automated to allow for the ideal ease of operation. And thank you all so much for your time and we'll now take any questions. So, so the benefit of using this device is speed, right? Then uh, how fast is it? I mean, usually the skilled nurses are really good at switching and... Yeah, they are. So speed is one of the side benefits. It's mainly just con the convenience of having to just... They don't have to uh, do two things at once really anymore. They don't have to insert the vial once it's full, take it out, grab a new one, put it in. It literally is just one button push and then it does the rest for it through sensors and a motor. And to expand upon that, sometimes if you're pregnant you can have at least 10 vials taken and there's like some, some problems include overfilling the vials or underfilling the vials so that way when we implement a, uh, a sensor system it's able to detect the correct level, withdraw the needle and then rotate to the next vial so you don't have you know as much air in your... There's also less discomfort to the patient. Um, when you have the vial switched out right next to your arm, there's some dumb jostling that's really uncomfortable. I like that you mentioned less automation because I can imagine maybe there's an input and it would be pretty bad if you input 100 instead of 10 and this could be a much bigger conveyor belt system or something like that. Uh, you don't necessarily need uh, a ton of automation there. Right. Can you clarify uh, what parts of the system are, I guess, single use or disposable? Uh, okay, so um, so the actual system itself, the quick draw system, would be this rotating platform on top, and then this base, and then the various sensors, and the sensor, the motor, and basically the electronic equipment. Um, this linear actuator part is part of the system, but um, it's duct tape right here. But it would be a basically a plastic clamp that would hold on to a disposable tubing. So if this right here is represented by the needle with the tubing, you would clamp this tubing into the system and the entire tubing with all the needles and all of the different vacutainers, those are all disposable because it's, they're blood contacting, so they have to be disposable anyways. Right, okay. So, so the, par the part that you have taped there with the needle, that would be replaceable or single yes. use? Yeah, yeah, it could be single use. It could attach to an arm. So none of the device does not contact any blood at any point in time. Okay. So when everything goes well, it's really good. Everyone's happy, but things happen, right? And so this, there are sensors and uh, motors. And so the failure control is really important, right? So we don't know what had happened. What's going to happen? Do you think you, you, your device can handle that robustness? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, definitely, if the sensor fails, then you're going to have overfilling of vials, and then you'll have blood everywhere. Right. But as we said, like uh, like going towards less automation would, in some cases, be ideal. You know, and that way you don't have to rely on a like an electronic system or a motor system in order to accomplish your needs. 
uh, initially instead of a motor system, Scott actually had the idea to have ridges within the outer circle and a pin connected to the inner circle. So the pin could be released, the thing could spin manually, and then the pin could be put down. So I think different components of it could also be manually made. I think the part about quantifying the speed is very important for your uh, value proposition because I think that probably the user would be a testing lab. You know, like when I am ordered to get a blood test, I go to a lab, you know, uh, that's dedicated to doing that. So you would, if you could convince them that uh, instead of, you know, 10 blood draws per hour, you can do whatever, 12 or 15, then I guess to me that's the key uh, selling point that you would have to demonstrate, I think, uh, for this. I have some concerns about the amount of waste that, that would be incurred in, in between the distance of the patient and the, and the device is because I mean right now if you know if you take one where you can attach the vacutators directly to the needle site there but it or I mean are y'all proposing that the length would be the same of a typical butterfly needle that has a small little tube that would typically be less than a foot in length? This would be a launch. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the, the device, yeah okay. this is a very scaled up prototype. Uh -huh. We were actually thinking the device would be more it, it would be handheld and it would probably have a diameter more around like three inches or so. Just yeah. enough to fill ten vials like back to back. Mm -hmm. And so then the angle of rotation between each would be very small mm -hmm. and that way you could you know do a lot within a short amount of time. Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. You're under pressure. Right. All right, take it away. Howdy. 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 So I'm Ankit Ramchandani, and I'm a junior computer science major from Texas A&M University. I'm Vasant Gurvari, and I'm an industrial engineering senior at Texas A&M. Uh, I'm Edgar Palapa. I'm a senior in electrical engineering at Cal State LA. Hi, my name is Kyle Miller. I am a computer science, majoring in computer science. I'm a junior from Auburn University. Hi, I'm Oluwa Sherry Morunfoye. I'm an electrical engineering senior here at Texas A&M. A and M University. Hi, I'm Danielle Ojeda, senior mechanical engineering major from University of Central Florida. And we are Data MD, and this is our video. The worst situation at St. Mary's Hospital at 187 percent over capacity. Verdun Hospital is 181% over, followed by Lakeshore at 177%, and the Jewish General at 164% over capacity. We could do better. What if we could predict the number of patients who'd go to the emergency room tomorrow so hospitals can be better prepared? Our research shows that we can predict the ER visits by social media data, Google Trends, and pollution data. For example, the number of searches of the word pneumonia on Google is noticeably higher in the winter months, which is actually when pneumonia is prevalent. We also noticed a small spike in the number of searches related to the symptoms of swine flu, just before we noticed a spike in the searches of the term swine flu itself. This potentially shows that we might be able to foresee an outbreak and warn hospitals and doctors well in advance. So will this data help us predict the next outbreak? Let's see. So that was unclear. Just a quick summary. We, uh, it is a rising problem that all hospitals are overcrowded in general. In, Actually, statistically, 63% of patients who want to go to the emergency room have to wait for 15 minutes longer to get meet their doctors, and that is a big problem. So our 
the proud need statement of our oh, that we chose to tackle over the weekend was to predicting was to predict trips to the emergency room days in advance so hospitals can optimize resources, schedule better, and patients can be helped better. So here are the five design requirements that we chose. The first requirement is that our design should be reliable. And as you'll, as you'll see, that our, we, we use a machine learning model. And by reliable, what we mean is that we, it should be, if it is accurate this year, it should be accurate for a for like number of years to come. And we, do, we, should have to not, we shouldn't have to retrain the model every time or in a, some intervals, right? The second thing is we should, be able, we should be able to categorize patients. So current methods that try to predict emergency room patients give out a number. So for example, 30 patients tomorrow are coming to the emergency room. But that, that, that's not very helpful, right? What we want is 10 patients probably are coming because of car accidents. Well, 15 maybe are coming for cardiac arrest and so on, right? So we want to categorize patients so hospitals can be better prepared. The third is that we want, to, want this model to be applicable to different locations. Since we're doing a lot of data mining from social media and Google Trends, we want to ensure that that data is taken spe is specific to the location of the hospital to, be more, to make it more accurate. Fourth, we want to potentially predict outbreaks. Now, as you will see in the presentation as it will unfold, we see that in some cases we can predict swine flu because the number of searches of coughs and cough fever and influenza related symptoms go up before swine flu swine flu score peaks so that might be one call one, one way by which we can predict potential outbreaks lastly it should be adaptable to a specific hospital by that we mean that hospitals should be able to input the number of doctors they have and our our product can potentially tell them oh this if these are the number of doctors you have this is how you want to schedule them So we came up with three design considerations. Our first one was a feedback system, which included reactionary measures that were placed on 911 tracking calls. So if someone called 911, we would send a message to the hospital and they would get an alert saying that they have one patient on the way. Another way to incorporate this is by using sensors in hospitals, where once there's a there's a patient sensed in the hospital, but also detect whether they have a certain burn or a certain whatever type of category injury. And it would place them in the appropriate room with the appropriate tools. The second consideration was using prediction based on intrusive parameters. These are patient data and medical history, which would be accessed by the hospital to gain more information about what patients have and what they will have for their next trips and predicting when they're gonna come back and what they might need for their next trips. And our last consideration, which is the one we went with, was basing it off external factors, such as environment <coughs> conditions and regional factors, such as air pollution and seasonal changes. We can detect what most of the population will go to the emergency room for. And we can also use social media to see whether or not an outbreak is about to occur using Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. So the first thing you, we looked at, as you'll see in this histogram, was trying to figure out how many patients come into a given hospital or what, what the probability of how many patients coming into a given hospital on a certain day. This data was taken from Marin County, California over a span of about five years about how many, what the probability of how many patients come to the hospital on a given day. As you can see, this data is very normally distributed, meaning, hey, if it falls in the green area, the hospitals are likely to see that many patients on a given day. So great, problem solved, except not really, because the hospitals may be prepared for whatever happens on those given days on well, normal basis, but how do we predict when those outliers occur? How do we know what's gonna be in that red area, when those things will occur? So, we realized that in order to predict those, we need to predict what events will cause the large amounts of people to come into the hospital. So, for example, a large outbreak of disease, such as the Zika virus in the end of 2015, early 2016. Now, if you'll notice, you can see that the Z initial Zika virus was originally, had an original outbreak, and about nine months later, it, it's microcephaly also started increasing in popularity of Google trend searches. So if you know anything about microcephaly, it's a common symptom of Zika in small infants of mothers who had Zika. 
So this nine month period makes sense given that nine months after the initial Zika outbreak, you see a large, large increase in children born with microcephaly, obviously. So what we noticed is that our we were able to correlate these data points as the symptom of this disease could be correlated to, the sim to, the, to another disease breaking out. All right, so the, as Savan talked about, the final design we chose to incorporate was a multiple machine, multiple machine learning models integrated into one. So common, um, common procedures used now are just one learning model. But what we decided to do is use multiple learning models with different parameters. So we're looking at, I want to predict how many people are coming for asthma. I want to predict how many people are coming for heart attacks, for car accidents, using all different parameters. So I can tell the hospital, hey, we're expecting 70 people, and this is what they're coming from. Prepare one day in advance. So going through our data, we're able to detect some, our, our model was able to detect some cyclical trends. So as you can see there, that pneumonia is more common in ERs during the winter months, which is normal, we know that. But our model is now able to take that knowledge and quantify it into people. Like, yes, it's January now. Expect 30 people today coming in for pneumonia. So basically all our model does is takes in environmental data, search data, um, Twitter data, people talking about their symptoms, and incorporates it and lets the ER know that you, sh you have to be ready for these people. You have to get more people on staff. You need to get more resources to accommodate these people. Uniqueness, how is our product different than what's already out there? Well, we reached out to different hospitals to see what kind of techniques they currently use to determine the crowdedness of their hospitals and how they use that information to schedule their doctors and nurses. One of the most system widely used techniques at the moment is called NEDOX, and you can see a picture of it in the top right. The two complaints with this product currently are, one, that it's very broad, it doesn't tell them like when uh, you know, overcrowding will happen, it just gives them the current status, and two, was that it was not very personalized. We address these issues by, one, actually telling them how to predict in the future, and two, offering them a uh, schedule that they could use with the current doctor availability. And this is just the user interface in a friendly way. Thank you for listening, and we'll let's take Thank you very much, and it was time for questions. <laughs> Not exactly my wheelhouse, but um, I, I saw that, you know, you were considering the intrusive parameters. I know you didn't select this, but it goes along with uh, where you're trying to scrape this, this data. Is there any worry about... Um, getting access to some of this data, you can't use patient data, FERPA laws and whatnot, uh, protecting privacy, so what are some concerns there? So we, we did not in our model first consider any private, like personal, patient specific data. So, but then we, we, while we were scraping data from say Google, so Google Trends, we cannot, be, it's not really scraping when the data is really available in the user friendly format for Twitter and everything. We tried to download the Twitter API and we, we did not like, Scrape, we did not do the scraping part in, over the weekend. We took the data manually, and then we focus, uh, tried to see if there are relations in the data, basically. And going off of that, we're not getting, other models try to use intrusive data. We found out that, yes, it's gonna be difficult to get that data, and it's also probably a problem. You don't want me knowing every time you go to the ER. So we're using more generali generalized data, looking for trends in society as a whole, so we can put a pulse on where society is. Did you look at potential to integrate with uh, like wearable fitness monitors, for example? Like to me, that's an incredible opportunity uh, if you're able to uh, test someone wearing a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, and then you offer this uh, component that will link or establish a correlation with these broader data set uh, to maybe do some predictive. So it's not just you know when maybe. I don't know the extent to which uh, that data is available through uh, uh, APIs for those devices, but um, you know, I, I, to me that seems like an opportunity to ex worth exploring. Yeah, of course. Um, so another problem statement that we thought would be wonderful to incorporate with ours is the 
tracking patients. So definitely, if you have a Fitbit, if you have a smartwatch, we can have a way to track you, to monitor your data if you allow us, to better, for us to better serve you. And that will tackle the problem of um, so like serving patients, you know, categorizing which patient is which, and also it's gonna help a lot of um, people in the medical industry. Yes, that's one pathway of customization to the individual hospital or system. Did y'all have any other ideas about customization that improves their own personal geographically located, uh, you know, uh, census or in uh, various very, uh, case profiles? I can, I, go ahead. Sorry. I was like, I can talk a little bit about that. So one of the interactive features of our machine learning software is that they would be able to input daily what uh, each kind of condition is. Like some of the most common ones are like cardiac arrest, trauma, mental illness, and they can see like a visual representation of it. And that's also uploaded to our cloud. So in a way the machine is learning more about their hospital. So the initial model is just kind of brought across all, but on a daily basis they upload this information and it kind of learns from what they're experiencing. Looks like you've answered all the questions. Did you have another one? Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
Howdy and welcome back. We're going to the second half of the presentations for NMED. I, uh, hopefully you've been impressed by what's been going on so far, and I think we've got five more teams here that are going to really wow you, uh, just as the first five teams did. I don't know if this next team is a comment on the entire weekend, but <laughs> this is Let Us Get Some Sleep. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mason Weems. I am a senior biomedical engineering major coming from Rowan University. Howdy. Uh, my name is Ryan Kinley, and I am a sophomore biomedical engineering major here at Texas a and I'm Joey Busher. I'm a senior bioengineering major from Clemson University. Uh, howdy. Uh, my name is Musay. Uh, I am an electrical engineering student. I'm a third year, and I'm uh, from Texas a and Corpus Christi. And we are Please Just Let Us Sleep. We're going to begin our introduction with a short animation. According to the American Sleep Apnea Association, it is estimated that 22 million Americans suffer from sleep apnea, with 80% of cases of moderate and severe obstructive sleep apnea undiagnosed. Sleep apnea is defined by a 10 second gap in breathing for periods of time during regular sleep, and many people experience fatigue and exhaustion the next morning. Normally, doctors use laboratory sleep tests to determine if someone has sleep apnea. But what if there was a more comfortable way to diagnose and to monitor sleep apnea? Introducing Smart Night Sleep, created by Please Just Let Us Sleep. We are a team consisting of biomedical and electrical engineers who want to improve sleep neckwear and the sensors that compose it. Smart Night Sleep looks like a neck pillow, but it contains pulse oximetry, pressure sensors, and a microphone to measure breathing noises and other relevant noises such as snoring. The acquired data is sent to the smartphone app via Bluetooth so that instances of sleep apnea are monitored accurately. This device has the potential to diagnose sleep apnea as well as effectively monitor the condition post-diagnosis and improve treatments of sleep apnea. Smart Night Sleep combines comfort with sensors to monitor sleep apnea and help millions of Americans gain a better night's sleep. So now, going into our needs statement, our goal is to design a proof of concept sleep neckwear device that can effectively mount sensors while not being intrusive to the patient. And we decided to focus on obstructive sleep apnea since it affects so many Americans and because so many Americans um, are undiagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. To get into more details about obstructive sleep apnea, we have to look at what defines it and what uh, symptoms and how it's diagnosed and treated. So sleep, obstructive sleep apnea is defined by breathing pauses that last at least 10 seconds during regular sleep, which occur often. Detectable symptoms include snoring and difficult breathing, as well as fatigue and exhaustion the next morning. This can be diagnosed through polysomnography or laboratory sleep tests, which are shown on the image to the left. These are very intrusive, and the wiring and detection that's needed to set these up uh, can be overcrowded and make it difficult to observe sleep patterns regularly. Treatment options are limited, but the most common option for this uh, disease would be CPAP machines, as shown on the image to the right. Um, okay, so our device is here to address like five requirements at the outside market. The first one is the non-intrusiveness, which is uh, our, de our device is not going to be interfering with the, our patient uh, um, peace or uh, pri pri peace privacy. And uh, the other one is the affordability. Uh, uh, we can say that our device can be uh, purchased for less than a thousand dollar. And a third uh, point that we are trying to address today here is uh, the ergonomic widget uh, adjustability. It's going to be as flexible and it's adjusted to any kind of thick uh, uh, neck or um, any kind of deposits if you have, like it's going to be adjustable. Uh, the other is going to be durability, which is um, we have. Um, some kind of uh, object on the back of the uh, device which is gonna hold it tight um, and it will be more flexible uh, during the motion so there is no any 
damage or something that can be caused to the device. Uh, the fifth point that we are addressing is going to be like sensor integration, which is uh, which is going to meet uh, the reliability um, in collecting data and transmitting, uh, and that would achieve the accuracy and preciseness of the data transmitted. So for our design, we considered a couple of different options. First, we considered like a form-fitting collar and necklace that went around only the neck. It gave very good options for sensor integration. However, it gave very little support. Um, Another thing we considered was a device that went around the complete head and neck. It gave much better support during sleep, however it was a little bit more difficult to integrate sensors into it and it was a little bit more intrusive to the patient. Finally, we ended up deciding on a hybrid solution. We used a travel neck pillow um, and then we were able to integrate sensors into that to still give the good sensor integration but it provided a moderate level of support that was less intrusive to the patient. So here's a kind of flow diagram of how our device works. So the pulse oximeter for sensor and the microphone collect data from the patient and send it to the microcontroller for processing. From there, it is displayed on the front end of our app and then um, sent to a um, algorithm on our device. So the algorithm is specifically logic that we came up with. It's not perfect for diagnosing because we didn't have the data to do so. However, we decided that if none of the sciences are finding anything, then obviously there's no apnea, apnea and we can't do anything about it. If we find one sensor is detecting apnea symptoms, then it's likely a false positive, but we still note it because we don't want to have the risk of it being wrong. If we have two or more sensors that trip as likely apnea, then we output a notification to the patient of a likely apnea event. So here in terms of a prototype de demonstration, you can see the circuitry a little bit. Um, the blue board on the right hand side of the left picture, that's the microcontroller itself that can, has all the control logic. And then there's a microphone speaker right next to that. And then we have that larger red chip, that's our Bluetooth module. And then on the top of that we have the um, plus oximeter. And on the bottom we have a force sensitive resistor. So you can see on our physical model, in the back we have the microcontroller here and the Bluetooth, they're sticking out just to show for demonstration that would be situated inside of it for the real thing. Um, and then you can also see that we have metal on the inside to provide additional support and show and structure for the device. Um, here we have our microphone to listen for snoring sounds and other signs of sleep apnea, as well as a speaker that we set up for an alarm so that we can notify the patient if needed. And then here we've also in implemented the force sensitive resistor that would be sitting over the throat of the patient when they're using it so that we can tell if they're breathing or not. And we also have the pulse oximeter inside so that we can detect blood oxygen and their heart rate as, we, um, as the patient is doing it. So next we have a short animation showing the working app. So the app you'd be able to access your Bluetooth settings and choose our uh, smart night sleep device. <coughs> and then uh, once you're connected, you would be able to view uh, almost real time data from our device showing heart rate, respiration rate, blood oxygen content, and whether or not there's a snoring. So the benefits of our product is, uh, is first it's cheaper, uh, because sleep study usually costs us around 1500 or more. The second one would be, um, it's more, uh, it records this accurate data and it also uh, sends it to the app where uh, the other user could communicate uh, with the information. The third one is comfortability. Um, it's more comfortable than any of uh, the polyseminography uh, because uh, those uh, devices have more of uh, wiring this and the adjustability is also another point of that. So in terms of future outlook, um, we have a lot of promise based on what we found this weekend. However, there are a couple things we're still looking to do. Um, first of all, we'd like to integrate machine learning into our system to eliminate noise. Um, many of the sensors that we're using are very susceptible to noise, um, especially like the microphone and the pressure sensor. There's all sorts of noise artifacts. There are noise from other things in the room for the microphone and then movement artifacts from the patient moving during their sleep. So we want to use machine learning to isolate those noise artifacts from the actual things that we're looking for from the patient. Um, additionally, as I mentioned before, our algorithm, it was simply a proof of concept algorithm that would not truly diagnose patient. So we'd like to integrate machine learning into it to collect real data from patients to more accurately diagnose them. Um, 
In addition, we have, right now we're transmitting data to the app over standard Bluetooth protocols. So there are some cybersecurity concerns with that we will need to address in the future. Um, as well as, we'd be interested in trying to integrate this with current treatments, since this is purely a diagnostic and monitoring technology right now. It does not replace any treatments. Um, we can also improve manufacturing and design for adjusting for different size patients and different, different neck sizes. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation and we'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. You have five minutes for questions. So, this, uh, sir, your device detects any any problems. Uh, any, any. Uh, is there any way to to enhance? I mean, uh, well, you said that you have the speaker so that you can just alarm mm -hmm. the, the patient, right? Uh, is there any other way to do it? Because it's actually you're waking up. The Person, which right. is not a good um, I mean, it's not a good solution in the long run, and we're, we're not proposing this as a treatment option. It's more of a diagnostic ability. Um, so we would be interested in the future in trying to interface this with some sort of diagnostic, possibly a CPAP or something, so we can adjust the settings to more accurately treat whatever issues they're having. Yeah, and going off of that, we uh, put the speaker on there. We'd much rather wake up a patient if they're all of a sudden stop breathing and instead of having them pass away on us. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of power requirements, how big of a battery do you think you're going to have, to have this plugged in or is it going to be powered up the battery all night? Or? Um, well, so the Arduino itself requires a 5 volt supply. Um, so that is a fairly standard battery. Um, I mean, looking at the size of it, we can fit a fairly large battery into this without needing to worry too much about it. Um, so I think that's a fairly simple issue to address. You, you think that's how big it would be? I mean, obviously a little, uh, you could deflate it a little if you needed. Yeah, we could try to adjust the size a little bit, but this is about the idea of what we had in mind. Um, it's just a good combination of support with integrate, integrating the sensors with it. I guess, again, uh, kind of following up on the previous question, uh, trying to understand uh, how does this help address the problem of sleep apnea? So is it telling, some, is it, will you envision this? Someone's not sure, they're having sleep problems, so this would help diagnose, or is it someone who uh, maybe is already using a CPAP uh, device? Would they use this to monitor their um, overall health, I guess? Uh, the, goal, the goal of our device is to monitor data and um, to collect data and monitor it, uh, it's not, and we can't see it in terms of like uh, replacing CPAP. However, it can enhance the treatment if in the in the future if we put it in a closed loop, we can enhance the treatment. So we've talked about it mainly in terms of diagnostic. Um, the sleep study, if I remember correctly, was on the order of fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars, whereas we could have this product for probably under a thousand dollars. So it has a lot of potential for low cost diagnostic abilities. Um, that being said, it's, it is specified towards obstructive sleep apnea, whereas the sleep study can diagnose any number of diseases. Um, for example, the sleep study would have like EEG data, which we can't integrate that only on the neck. Um, but in terms of obstructive sleep apnea, it's not necessarily relevant. Yeah, because what, uh, seeing what you have here makes me think in, you know, maybe like a smart CPAP machine where you could right. integrate maybe some sensors to uh, monitor, uh, enhance the... And we have talked about those options. Um, we just, in the, in the context of this weekend, we didn't have the time to design the sensors and an entire CPAP machine to go with it. Uh -huh. And didn't have the medical background to say that it works efficiently to do that. Right. Or isn't it that maybe if you have the pillow and maybe you can just put it, put it right next to it, and then just you can just design a smart app, smartphone app that can do exactly the same thing. Like for example, using the microphone on the phone, right. the phone mm -hmm. right. or yeah. the speaker, things mm -hmm. like that. It's similar, but uh, some of our sensors need to be like contact, in contact with our skin. Like for example, the pulse sensor and the uh, force sensor that we have there. So mainly it has to be attached a little to the skin. Okay, thank you very much.
Hey, thank you very much. Go ahead. All right, this is Team Brain Freeze, and we'd like to talk to you about therapeutic hypothermia. Cardiac arrest is, has a very high mortality rate, and it's due to uh, a variety of reasons. The brain starts to undergo uh, a degeneration, basically a self-destruction, where certain chemical processes start to take place, uh, which accelerate cell death. From the time of arrest to the time you reestablish that circulation is what determines your survivability. By starting uh, hypothermia, by reducing the body's core temperature, you actually stop the internal injury process that takes place on a chemical basis. How you institute hypothermia can vary. The main goal is to try to drop that temperature down to about 32 degrees Celsius within about three to six hours of the time of the arrest. That's your magic window of achieving that hypothermia. You happen to be picked up by an ambulance who is equipped and educated. A hypothermic cooling blanket could be applied ice packs uh, placed into the, into the high circulation areas, the, the axilla, the under. Uh, therapeutic hypothermia has not been widely adopted. It's one of these unusual therapies in our world, uh, which we see often with a lot of novel therapies. It's been around and accepted for almost a decade, but has been slow to evolve into common practice. And it's one of the things that we're dealing with from a medical education standpoint is to get this therapy out to the public and get it instituted in a timely manner. Gentlemen, so we are Team Brain Freeze just for a quick introduction. My name is Chris Troop. I'm a junior mechanical engineer at the University of Arkansas. And we have Michael. I'm an med student, just starting this year. And we also have Pierce. I'm an aerospace engineering student here at A&M. Frisco. I'm also an aerospace engineering student here at A&M. And Joel. I'm also an aerospace engineering student at A&M. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Jace. I'm a physics student from Charleston State University. <laughs> Alright, so just kind of dealing with the problem. So what the methodology we're trying to work with is to have therapeutic, um, uh, therapeutic hypothermia and induce that as quickly as possible. And so why this is such a big problem is we see worldwide, according to Decker in 2011, approximately 94% of the people that undergo cardiac arrest, they actually are going to die when they have cardiac arrest. And so narrowing that down a little bit more, in the United States, there are about 500,000 uh, cases of cardiac arrest each year. Outside of the hospital, that's about 350,000. Uh, cases annually just inside the United States. And so in order to kind of save that, so as the, the video stated, it preserves neurological function when you induce this therapeutic hypothermia. And according to the University of Colorado in 2015, when you induce uh, uh, hypothermia into patients with cardiac arrest, what you see is about 2.5 times increase in survival in, from cardiac arrest patients and also a 3.3% increase in neurological function overall. And so again, we are trying to use hypothermia as uh, a therapy, so mild sustained hypothermia has been shown to increase neurological function and survival rates among uh, cardiac arrest patients and other similar injuries. So our need statement is we need a robust portable method to induce hypothermia during ambulance transport and maintain it for up to six hours with minimal health care staff intervention. That's kind of a handful, but to kind of break it down, primarily what we're trying to solve is we're trying to make it portable. So we want to have this be able to fit on an ambulance. And then we're also going to want to induce this hypothermia as quickly as possible. The quicker we can lower the body, the core temperature down, the faster we can preserve that neurological function. And then we also want to maintain it for a long time. So bringing us to our requirements, our first requirement is it needs to be operatable in an ambulance. So it needs to be modular and reloadable. All of these parts can be uh, tr uh, exchanged and used again. Uh, and we need to be able to induce hypothermia to approximately 32 to 34 degrees Celsius or 
90 degrees Fahrenheit. It needs to have low power consumption. We have a battery, so we don't need to use any of the power consumption on an ambulance. It needs to operate in a safe manner. We need to reduce this core temperature as uh, quickly as we can in a safe manner without uh, having any frostbite or any other negative effects. And then we also need to sustain the transition to the hospital. So we need to be able to maintain this hypothermia for about six hours uh, or because that's about the longest time that an ambulance ride could be. And that's a lot longer than the longest time. So we looked at four possible solutions. One would be an IV cold saline. Secondly, we could use cold packs, which were both introduced in the video. Healthier elements, just putting a machine on the body. And then finally, nasal delivery. And then we're going to have Mike talk about the solution. We decided to go with IV cold saline and cold packs. Initially, we're going to apply cold packs to the body in, immediately as the patient arrives in the ambulance. This will cause the body temperature to drop relatively quickly, giving us uh, a little time to perform CPR and to administer I, uh, cold saline drip. We're going to connect our saline pump to a thermometer and a microcontroller so that we don't need the ambulance staff or the nurses at the hospital to continually monitor the body temperature and make adjustments to the flow rate of the saline. Uh, once we have this system hooked up in place and the body temperature's uh, fallen into a hypothermic state, the saline pump should be able to run in an automated fashion for up to six hours on the battery pack without any intervention from healthcare staff. Uh, we've been prototyping and we've got a feedback controller that we designed. It's going to run on an Arduino. It's going to measure the body temperature and it's going to pump uh, saline in. We've already written all the code that we need to get this working. And we've designed a cooling blanket, which will be designed to describe with this. So this is the fast cooling blanket that we thought of. Uh, in hospital, they use some different methods. Uh, one of the ones was shown in the video, which was placing packs on the body that cold water is run through. But we need this to be smaller. We need it to fit in a small compartment in an ambulance. So <laughs> we're using chemical cooling, which is ammonium nitrate. So that is not near as pure as it would be. And it would be a powder in this case. So it activates much faster. And having water packs on the chest, it would then be broken, much like a instant cold pack you can get at the store. And we're leaving space above the chest for um, AED and CPR usage, whatever's needed, and also space on the inner thighs for um, introduction of a catheter. So we did a bit of the math for it, and we determined that the necessary amount that we would need is about four kilograms of ammonium nitrate and roughly a gallon of water. So about as big as this example was. And then for the catheter, it is often either uh, speared into bone or it is uh, weighted to be put in at the hospital. So rather than that, we've had Pierce design a mock-up of something that might uh, stabilize that more and provide a port to put that through and hold it still in a bumpy ambulance ride to get that going much faster so we can get the cold IV in. So now on to our product integration. So our product is designed to be integrated with existing medical technology. Uh, the whole box includes our uh, cavity for our external devices, our battery, and the actual cooling device. So it's, we're designing it to be uh, integratable with existing, first of all, saline bags. We'll have a cavity that will be able to hold a saline bag, and every time we need to replace it, they can just be easily taken out and replaced, reconnected to the system. Uh, the whole system will use the existing tubing as well. Um, all of this tubing in here is going to sit inside of a, uh, another tube, so it can be replaced with every patient. And then as well, the whole system is designed to be small enough to fit in any standardized um, ambulance size. Um, as well, we're going to use a peristaltic pump to actually pump through these uh, standardized tubes, which uh, uh, holds, uh, which is a pretty precise flow system. Uh, there's also, it's going to be attached to the gurney to travel with the patient into the hospital. And it has a long battery life to allow it to make its way to the uh, into the hospital. So for future advances, we just need to decrease the size 
of the device and we can make sure it's testable through cl clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and judges, you have five minutes for questions. So no one's using any any uh, similar technology in, in ambulance? No, sir. It's been applied in hospitals, but then uh, it's not been applied in ambulances. What is applied in ambulances is very rudimentary. They just throw ice on it. They're not, they're not measuring the temperature and using that feedback to decide how powerful a cooling mechanism they need. So if they don't have feedback control, they're just guessing. And as a result, occasional patients survive or chill below that therapeutic window. But yeah, just to reinforce that, most of the time, as the video stated, in ambulances they don't do anything uh, in order to try to cool the body. They wait till the hospital. It's very difficult. It's in order to put a catheter in in the femoral artery or femoral vein. They normally they have to spear the bone sometimes, and that's not something you can do in a bumpy ride between the the incident and the hospital. I think I'm a little unclear about the whole process. I get a lot of the pieces. Can you walk us through? You know, yes, get into the uh, so ambulance. So, um, reducing a re inducing hypothermia in, in a patient reduces the the amount of oxygen that uh, their brain uses, and so it increases their ability to, uh, or it decreases their neurological damage after the fact. And so, um, used to. Uh, Sometimes, in order to do these things in a hospital, they you know just pile ice on the on a patient, uh, or they you know, cover them in ice packs. But then they have it's very difficult to not overshoot the temperature in that case and do further damage to the patient. And so what they try to do in the uh, what has proven to be more effective is the introduction of a saline with a catheter, directly chilled saline, directly into the blood, and then with that you can control. The, uh, the temperature much more effectively, keep it, uh, you know, keep it steady, but then it's a lot uh, slower than just dumping somebody in ice. Um, and so, what we want to do is that we want to, uh, we want, we don't want this to be a 30 minute or 40 minute process like it is now before a, a, a patient can get the care they need. We want to be able to just quick, we want to have something quickly, you know, like a, a, a rip cord kind of uh, vest that we can put over them immediately to, get, to start chilling down their body while the uh, while we prepare the, uh, the catheter implant into their uh, so and once we get to once we get them to a level where we can uh, where they're close to hypothermia we can inject the catheter and we can control their temperature more stably and uh, so, so uh, I guess what is controlling the temperature of the saline what's that feedback loop coming from the box Yes, sir. We've got a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've got a. Um, so we've got an Arduino with the code written already to take uh, readings from a thermometer and adjust the flow rate of the saline. The saline's going to come out at more or less a fixed temperature. Um, okay. What's the flow rate? The flow rate's the primary way that, mm -hmm. or the easiest way that we can control uh, the temperature, and that's an advantage because you don't want to be introducing more saline than you need to. Uh, because there's, there's an upper limit. You can't dilute your blood into the mouth and still have is, is, is anybody doing that with chilled saline for, for this? It, in the hospital, yes. Okay, that's how they do it. No. Yeah. Uh, and even, even there, it's not yeah. broadly applied. Uh, but there's there's definitely doctors administering this as a, as a routine procedure and not as a clinical experiment. Because I was thinking, even just room temperature, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, it, that feels cold, so, sure. so yeah. I don't know. It's Any idea if this is really uncomfortable because it's so cold? Or well, usually I've had a heart attack, so you're yeah. not yeah. that it's worried. About that. It's, it's better to be uncomfortable. You're already very uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've had one, but no, no. it's not yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe a little dopamine and saline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of drugs that you would have to administer with these anyway. You can prevent shivering. Yeah. But no damage, shock. maybe, from prevent shock. how cold we're talking. Is it still... I mean, it, it's not that it's no damage, it's that it's that is minimal. less damage than you would get without it. Yeah. Um, Focusing on survival and 
being able to recover from it. John Hopkins has had uh, considerable success with this kind of technique. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay, take it away. Howdy, everyone. Howdy. My name is Kristen Arias, and uh, I'm a communication major here at Texas A&M. Howdy. My name is Apel McAllister, and I am a computer science major. Howdy. My name is Daniel Claybaugh, and I'm a mechanical engineer over here at Texas A&M. Hi, I'm Ben Gore. I'm a junior aerospace engineering major here. My name is Russell Rue. I am a mechanical engineering major at Lamar University and our team name is Impatient Patients. We would like to introduce you to our need statement, which is often kids need procedures that require them to be still. They may be filled for these procedures, even when there is no pain involved. Please design a solution in to, for supporting children throughout clinical procedures. Here's a short video to give you an introduction. Doctor visits with young children can quickly turn nightmares for both the fearful child and the stressed parents. Nonetheless, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends parents to take their children in for a health check at least nine times during the first three years and an annual checkup afterwards. Those are a lot of visits, often accompanied by a lot of tears. Tears that can be avoided. Inpatient patients have devised a multi-dimensional program to change what may seem a nightmare with the boogeyman to an adventure with the hero. Our program aims to alleviate fears by effectively distracting the patient through captivating audio, eye-catching visuals, and immersive physical activities. We at Impatient Patients believe that a change in attitude must begin at home. Therefore, parents will receive a helpful brochure with informative tips on producing a positive experience. In the waiting room, children are given access to a safely encased tablet with our game, Clinical Clues. Research has shown that playing video games can help reduce anxiety in children. More hands-on patients are given the opportunity to assume the role of a doctor's assistant. For procedures that require children to be still, animated shorts are provided. Small prizes are offered for a job well done. Ultimately, this program is highly customizable to the patient's and doctor's preferences, culminating in a flexible, stress-free experience for the whole family. Impatient Patients Program. Thank you for your patience. We had five requirements for our solution. One was the time limit. We need to get the children in and have them taken care of in 15 minutes. So we have to make sure that our procedure is in a timely manner. We also want to mitigate the fear and reduce the anxiety that is associated with uh, just normal checkups and even painful procedures like getting shots. We want to involve the parents because oftentimes children are scared. So if they see the parent is not scared, it will calm them down and help them through the process. We want to the children will need to remain stationary at certain times, such as whenever they're getting their nose or ears checked. So we want to make sure they can stay still and can use uh, video games to kind of facilitate that. And the procedure must be completed. If it's not completed, 
we haven't done our job. So we have three approaches that we've taken. That is visual, audio, and physical activities. This also doubles as the three most common learning styles um, of visuals, auditory, and kinesthetics. So some of the things that can be included inside the visual and audio categories are our game app and in-visit presentations. For physical activities, we have a strategy we, we like to call play acting. We want this to be an educational experience as well as entertainment. So in patient patients program begins in the home of the patient. So the program begins whenever the parent signs up or registers for our actual program. And whenever they do that, they'll receive a brochure, such as that one, in the mail or email, depending on their preference. Once the patient's inside the waiting room, they'll have access to our game application. When they're in their actual appointment, the patient will have the ability to do play acting or view our presentation depending on their learning type and their preference. Lastly, before they leave, they'll receive a prize for a job well done. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so when looking at the brochure, one of the most important things that we believe in is having education for both the children and the family. If you look within the brochure, we talk about general strategies to help keep your child calm and specifically talk about how not to vilify the doctor. Uh, in today's day and age, you know, it seems like people tend to use the doctor as almost like a punishment. They'll say, hey, you know, if you keep acting up, we're going to send you the doctor, he's going to give you a shot, so on and so forth. And uh, we want to try to avoid that because we don't want to prime any mechanisms that would cause them to feel fear when actually going into the doctor. So our brochure itself will go over different means like that and we'll also tell you some of the things that we do to help keep our children calm. So this is just kind of a short clip from our actual game. It just shows how you start off in the game, you just click start, and there's a little pause. And then the game starts and you have your character, you play from the perspective of the doctor. And so you can move using the arrows at the bottom, as you can see from here. And currently there's no animation, but in the future we hope to add animation. And currently we have different characters and such, but we just wanted to show a little demo. An additional one is item collection. So you, as you can see here, you'll move, and in the background you see different medical items. And so it just says the name, and if you click on the sticky note, you'll see that the, it's updated to how many you've found and the clipboard right there shows kind of which ones you have and which one you still need to get. And, and the, okay, and then so the item updating also happens right when the item disappears and you'll see that right when they click on it, it just goes right into there and colors it. And lastly, the objective is to get to the waiting room to see your patients because that's, in the end, that's what the doctor is trying to get to. So we all like to know that kids love to play pretend, right? They play house, they play with vacuum cleaners, and by doing that, they learn about these things. In the same way, we want to give them toy medical equipment so they can learn about them. They can uh, take the heart rate of the chosen doll or the parents if they want to get involved. <coughs> so the goal of this is to uh, have physical activities, right? This is one of the main learning styles. Research says that children from two to seven are primarily kinesthetic learners. We believe then that the strategy will be very successful. Now, an important strategy for mitigating anxiety and fear is to basically provide information to the child. And so we have a presentation that goes on uh, as part of the procedure, uh, advanced by the doctor, so it's all at their discretion. Um, and so basically, you know, it keeps the child's attention and provides a little bit of basic information so they understand what the doctor's doing. And, you know, we geared this towards a, a physical where the doctor's checking your routine things, but this could be customizable to match any procedure, like getting a shot, or there's tons of examples out there. As you can see, we have our diverse cast of characters here. Um, these are just the ones we have right now, but we could create uh, more, especially on demand, let's say they want to put the doctors inside of the animations, we can do that. That way the children can familiarize themselves with the people they'll be meeting, and in a way their online heroes will come to life before them. 
And so at the end, every good child deserves the reward for going through a medical procedure. So uh, giving them a prize, like candy, coloring book, uh, would help them associate sort of a positive emotion with uh, going to the doctor. So a little bit of Pavlovian training there. So there's actually some research out there now about uh, using distraction to help kids through these processes. There's some that say if you use a, let a child play a video game before you have a checkup or a harmful medical procedure, they will be more relaxed and they won't be so anxious because they're distracted. And there's some research also out there about using some uh, head mounted displays that can kind of distract them from the shot. And there's also some expenses that will be associated with our plan. So these are some upfront costs that the hospital will have to pay. But it's up to them to decide if it's a reasonable, uh, I guess, cost for the advantages we provide. So when looking at the future, uh, if this were to, you know, green light, we would be looking at probably looking at what sort of video games would affect the uh, outcome the most. Right now, there is research saying that video games help calm kids down. Heads up displays help uh, feel less pain while getting shots and things along the nature of that. But we don't know to what extent. And we're really looking at like what is the most effective means. So if we're green greenlit, we'd like to beta test that and see what we could do with that. So in conclusion, our goals are to reduce stress, as as well as, um, of course, facilitate a healthy relationship. Okay, thank you between very much. See you another time. Sorry. Thank you very much. Judges, you have five minutes. Obviously, as a pediatrician, um, this hits uh, close to home for me and in the process of wanting to make, um, you know, the medical experience as least traumatic for kids as, as possible. As pediatricians, pediatric nurses, so on and so forth, we all really try to create an environment, but it remains quite cold and uh, uncomfortable for kids. I like uh, the idea of the at starting before they even come to the clinic. Um, uh, I was a little unclear on what you were proposing during the procedure itself. I understood the home, the, the, the waiting area, but during the procedure itself, what are y'all proposing? All right, so the play acting. Uh, we want to give them medical equipment and the doctor will show them how to use medical equipment. So the different procedures, they'll know how to do it and that'll eliminate the fear of the unknown. And we'll also have presentations for the procedures where they need to stay still. So they have like little animations and fun shorts to watch. So y'all see this as a whole system from home to through the right. procedure. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All the way until they pick up the prize and head home. Right. We're, we're trying to basically create a plan. So something that, you know, medical professionals can go to and health care providers can go to and say, if we follow these particular guidelines and work on these particular tasks, then we, we, we can create the uh, best procedure and the best um, health experience for these children. And this is all customizable, so if a kid's going through a long procedure, you know, at the after going through our little presentation, we can throw on some Tom and Jerry, at the, you know, it's all up to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And the game itself is very customizable, because this game itself was created in about 12 hours of just like actual coding, and that's without any, any experience, and that experience, that um, could be sped up. It, with experience, it could be cut down to one day of actual work. Did y'all narrow this to a particular um, target age range? Yes, sir. Um, toddlers up to around seven years old. Uh, that's because the research said that physical activities, that's the main learning style for this age group. <coughs> we could also expand upon this further, and that's another thing we at some point would like to do is go through and see when you're looking at people, you know, of a higher age bracket, maybe seven to ten, before they go into, you know, adult physicals or adult style physicals, what sort of things you can do to help calm them down? Because some of the things will overlap, like the uh, heads up display and things along the lines of that. I think you mentioned age range uh, between two and seven, but then I'm pretty sure, I'm, I, I can clearly see that you have some words in your game. Can they read it? That would be part of future developments where they have voiceovers where instead of them having to read it, it would say it. So that way it would help the children who can't read yet, as well as um, making the game more complex. Instead of finding whatever medical equipment, it would be specific ones, such as there would be a doctor, oh, I need my stethoscope. And they would have to go and find it. And so that way they're learning, and they're also becoming less anxious about the experience through learning the experience, like what's going to happen.
And if we have the doctor's input, the user's age, then we can easily just have annotations in that text. So I had a couple of questions, depending on time, but maybe the first one following up to that question, uh, I think you, uh, I like this idea, and I like the idea of uh, assuming the role of the practitioner uh, by, by the patient. Uh, but you kind of you talked about two things. One is kind of uh, engaging the the patient by informing them what's going on and making it kind of educational. But then you also talked about distracting them uh, to try to take them maybe away so that they're not uh, afraid of the procedure. So those, in some ways, seem like different goals. Uh, have you thought about that? The the latter one is. Uh, aimed more towards painful procedures like shots. So in there we want to distract, and in the other procedures we want to more inform, like uh, looking at their ears. That's something they can learn about, and they can know that it's not painful at all. Uh, to, add, to add alongside that, um, there's also, you know, different people have different tricks, you know what I mean? So when looking at it from that, some people might still be freaked out even if you show them how it goes, and what might work best for them is an informative video. Like all of our cartoons and things that we talk about in that sense, are all based off our, off our characters and are based off of learning about the actual medical world and learning, you know, what's going on with you. So with that being said, you know, if for whatever reason, hey, you know, doing it on a doll doesn't work, well, now you have the option of just watching something and meanwhile you'll be distracted enough that I can look up your nose or look into your ear or do whatever else I need to do to ensure that, you know, I can finish my appointment and make my other appointment times. Uh, and I don't think we mentioned this, uh, but the game and the presentations will both be controlled by the actual doctor so that way they can if they're paying too much attention to it they could stop it and then it would get their attention and unfortunately your time has run out thank you for being patient <laughs>
to be the future of paracentesis implemented in all clinical settings, decreasing the associated complications and improving the experience of the patients in the United States and even the world. So uh, what is the main problem? Um, as the video discussed, so just to take a step back here, um, so in the United States we have over 200,000 patients um, who have um, liver cirrhosis and they commonly, um, and a common complication is a disease known as, or a complication known as ascites. Ascites is basically um, an accumulation of fluid um, inside the abdominal cavity and that is in 75% of the liver cirrhosis patients. Now, to uh, fix that or to manage that, uh, there's a procedure known as paracentesis where the needle is injected into the abdomen and this will then aspirate the fluid um, out of the abdomen. Now, the problem with that is that there are certain risks. Number one, um, the clinician may hit the wrong organ, so therefore this will lead to um, perforation. The second thing is, well, because, because um, the clinician may um, hit the wrong place, um, he may have to insert the organ or insert the needle multiple times. So this will lead to um, infection. The third thing is, what if the clinician um, perforates um, a blood vessel? So this will lead to hemorrhage. And then finally, because of this risk that is associated with, the, uh, with this procedure, um, this will uh, require that the uh, maneuver of the person has to be extremely um, trained. And now, um, Nilofar will talk about the design requirements. Okay, so for the design requirements, we need to have a device that is safe to have minimal patient complica complications. It also needs to be effective so that it needs to remove the fluid from the peritoneal um, cavity. It needs to be repeatable. It means that it needs to be consistent and provide accurate information, accessible so that everyone can use it, and also feasible so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel but rather innovative. Now I'm going to pass it back to Topic. He's going to talk about the design alternatives. All right, so uh, as we were brainstorming solutions for uh, this issue, um, number one, we thought of we can have like an osmotic pouch. The osmotic pouch will allow the fluid to be drawn from the abdomen into the pouch. The second idea that we came up with is why not have an MRI mimic an ultrasound that gives a full body scan or a uh, full scan of the abdominal region. The third idea we had is we can have a transducer that is ingestible on a pill where that pill will allow for the fluid to, uh, to be decreased and also it will allow us to um, visualize what's going on inside the abdomen. And that's the MRI and that's the pill. However, um, the solution that we ended up to come up with um, design-wise, uh, Samantha will elaborate on that, but um, as for the innovations that we came up with, is we, number one, um, we came up with an idea to have a complete body scan, and this will also allow the 3D reconstruction of the abdomen, and also this um, will allow um, the pinpoint localization um, of where you want to insert the needle, <coughs> so it will have an accurate depth measurement and also the right orientation of the needle, so this will minimize infections, hemorrhages, and will also uh, minimize perforation. And also, because this is all done by the machine, this will minimize human error, and also, it is very easy to use, so you don't have to have um, that much of expertise to maneuver this device. And now Samantha will talk about how this, uh, how this design or device work. Okay, so this is our large-scale prototype of the device. The actual device will be the same size of a normal ultrasound probe. So on the bottom, we have our ultrasound transducer. Then we have the channel for the needle. On top, we have this disc and... Uh, linear actuators to control and allow full motion of the needle to reach any angle, as well as a linear actuator on the inside to allow for a needle insertion. If you look on the screen, how the device will work is that the user will scan the entire abdomen, will scan the entire abdomen, all the way across the abdomen, and then the software will develop a 3D reconstruction of the abdomen, will determine these values, which are depths and angles of the deepest fluid pockets, it will then choose the deepest value and notify the user where that is. The user will then trace and try and find it, and as soon as they do, it will alert the user to that location, and then the user can um, hold it still and insert the needle, and the machine will do the rest of the work. As far as product feasibility, we expect this to be very feasible to implement because we are using pre-existing technology, we, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
And also, since ultrasounds are commonly used in the hospital setting and it's such a small device, it can just be added onto any common ultrasound card, which should be a really easy modification to the hospital setting. Uh, now, Kendrick will talk about future directions. So at Sun Statistics, you know, after this whole planning step, we'd like to perform some research with this, find out you know, exactly how to make it work. Once the research is done, we'd like to implement that into the clinical field in the United States. And you know, once that's in action, we want to extend this out to, uh, globally to the uh, third world countries, to developing countries, and that way that we can fix parasit or improve parasitism procedure all over the world. Another um, far, like further in the future application we'd like to look into is potentially using this for other synthesis procedures. Um, we've learned that you know thoracosynthesis and amniocentesis are among, like, a few of the other procedures, but all of them function you know by the same procedure where you have to scan it and you're trying to remove fluid from that cavity of the body. So um, in the far future, we'd like to extend research into that as well. Thank you for your time. You have five minutes. Really, really cool. Um, Thank you. What do you think about uh, the depth and, and possible changes? Those, those numbers are when you scan it once, is that going to change over time? Should yeah, we would certainly have to account for patient movement because if you've seen an ultrasound before while you're doing it, there is movement of the organs, there's movement of the body. So obviously, you'd encourage the patient to stay still, but also because you're using the ultrasound the whole time for the whole procedure, we could adapt and have it in a real time so it could tell you or it would move itself, actually. If the angle were to change, whatever the best depth is, it would change itself in real time. So you find that spot, you put it on there, you can read, it is 20, mm -hmm. and if it goes down to 15, maybe you're still okay, but you can tell. Yes. Right. And of course, um, with every angle you choose, because you're going to be sliding across, um, different angles have different depths for like one point. So that's why uh, one of our innovations we thought about were the 3D reconstruction. You know, And up here, you know, basically, it's going to have an overlay of each each angle, you get one image, you can overlay that image with another one you know, using computations. And once those computations are put together, you do find the, the deepest crevice in the body that you want to reach. And from that point on, it'll tell you, hey, this is exactly where you put the transducer, and now it'll run a few more like, um, scans, that is, and then the angle will be calculated for injection. And uh, like you're saying, it might change. I don't know if you, you can't hold your breath during the whole thing, but that's kind of like taking a panorama with your phone, and then somebody moves, so you maybe takes a couple passes, but... Yeah. Uh, it's I probably mean, like taking multiple images uh, at different yeah, points in it. time and then averaging all out. This will give you a very good representation of um, the average position of every single organ and therefore the, this will give you kind of a very safely way to insert the needle. I think it would still be a better approach than how it is now because now, I mean, you use the ultrasound, the physician just has to see where they think the correct angle is, where they think the correct location is, and insert it themselves. So the, the physician does see that movement, but there's not a whole lot of adjusting they can do as well. So this is still, I think, the improvement for that. I guess maybe you can uh, clarify for me. So yeah, this is an interesting idea. Uh, but so how is that different from just, or how would that be different from just using a standard ultrasound uh, uh, device that's uh, used in practice now and adding a module to report the numbers, uh, the depth uh, of, the, of the area, and then incorporate that functionality in a standard ultrasound system. That and that's, that's kind of funny because that's exactly what we were thinking originally. We were like, you know, what difference is this, you know, from this and that. But we watched a video, we saw like a procedure of someone teaching, like, you know, viewers how to perform paracentesis. Uh, and yeah, you, you have a general idea, maybe it's on the right side of the body. You scan that in, you find like, okay, this, you know, this spot on this body, right here, I'll make a little mark, that's where I need to make the injection. And then they take it out, then you need to add the anesthetic, then you need to add, you know, then you actually do the injection or the removal of the fluid aspiration. But how do you tell what angle it is? And that's where we wanted to, have, like, you know, improve on. You know, I know that it's at this spot here, but what if I put my needle at this angle here, or this angle here, or down? That's where you have the bowel, bowel perforations, and then, you know, if you miss, you have to re-inject it or reinsert it, and that leads to infections. But I guess, does that, is that enabled by the hardware design? Right. Or is it through, a uh, algorithm analysis algorithm for this would be the analysis algorithm that's where the 3d reconstruction comes in it tells you exactly the point you landed there and so once you're at that point you know it runs a few more scans with the ultrasound again and it tells you hey like you'll run like move this panel here that's why this is mobile yeah. 
it'll move it around and basically let's say this angle is the perfect one, it'll lock that in, then the user inserts the needle into the sheath and then it'll start the um, Oh, okay, so it helps you line up. The exactly, ice so that there's like okay. very minimal, okay. I would say there's almost no user interference at all, no human error to say, mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit more to the left. Yes, so basically it takes out, like you said, the human error, you have to do less thinking, mm -hmm. the machine does the thinking for you, that way you don't have to travel to someone who's who's been trained in this year after year after year and knows how to do it well if somewhere that you're at doesn't have someone that's as well trained. And to uh, agree with that also is that because it doesn't require um, a person to have prior knowledge, so you don't have to have experience, for example, in radiology or anatomy, um, because the device will do that for you. It will tell you exactly what the distance is, what the safe margin is, it will inject the needle directly. So it will give very, very accurate representation. So rather than, for example, um, hitting it here, um, and, you, and probably if, you're, if a person were to do it, maybe they'll have to do it by, say, 20.5, and it's actually 20, the device will do it exactly at 20 with the exact angle. So therefore, minimizing human error and improving the, uh, the what, what was priorly uh, developed. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to get them off because needles bother me. <laughs> <laughs> Cholesterol monitoring device uh, is the next iTrack Cholesterol. Welcome everyone, thank you for uh, attending our um, talk. Uh, our group is Noah's Angels and our device is iTrack Cholesterol. My name is Noah Geis and my teammates will introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Anissa Whitworth. I'm a junior biomedical engineering major here at Texas a and I'm Caitlin Moore. I'm a junior mechanical engineering major here at Texas a and My name is Sean Fashina. I'm a junior biomedical engineering major at Baylor. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Leon and I'm a Senior electrical engineering student here at Texas a and And I'm Morgan Ho. I am a junior nuclear engineer from here at Texas a and And I have a story for you. Uh, this is my grandma. Um, so my Nana suffered from high cholesterol and required frequent monitoring. And so we would frequently have to um, go through our test, and I would have to manually log the data for her. And so uh, that experience has led me to choose this topic. Here I'm grateful for the opportunity to pursue um, a change of care. And so um, here we have a video now to showcase our approach. Did you know that 102 million Americans have high cholesterol? High cholesterol can contribute to coronary artery disease, causing early death in more than 600,000 Americans each year and billions of dollars in related costs. So what is coronary artery disease? And why is cholesterol so bad? Cholesterol is a biological molecule that in excess can create plaque buildup in your arteries. When enough blockage occurs, a clot is likely to form, leading to a heart attack and possibly cardiac arrest. So, as a patient, what can you do? Based on your condition, your physician can opt for medication such as statins or suggest changes to your lifestyle. But how do you know if these changes are actually lowering your cholesterol? With the inspiration of other medical devices, we developed a handheld cholesterol monitor for at-home patient use. 
Our solution is a unified system that combines the Lancet and paper strip to streamline the cholesterol testing process. This makes our device more convenient, less expensive, and could reduce the number of patient visits to healthcare facilities. Our technology will seamlessly communicate with your smartphone or computer to automatically track and record the data through an app. We hope to improve the lives of patients who are suffering from hyperlipidemia, possibly adding many more years to their lives. I track cholesterol for everyone. As I was alluding to before, there is an existing market for cholesterol monitoring devices at home. However, these lack in accuracy and they're rather um, expensive because it costs upwards of five dollars per test and so if it's a frequent test that you're taking you know that cost really adds up our need statement is to design a self-monitoring cholesterol device for patients that are at risk for coronary artery disease and to uh, help reduce doctor visits some of the risk factors for coronary artery disease is high cholesterol, smoking, family history, and diet. Uh, the objective of this device is to create an affordable device that allows uh, consumers to easily monitor their cholesterol levels and track and record for their physician to see. So initially when we're trying to tackle some of these uh, requirements and our own uh, objectives for our projects. We had a couple of uh, ideas. Our first idea was we thought why not do a wearable device? So we were thinking maybe doing a watch or a bracelet or maybe some sort of patch that the user could wear, but we decided to go away from that. Uh, instead we were thinking okay maybe let's do a typical pinprick test but we'll incorporate some sort of tracking mechanism for, for it since others are lacking. And thirdly, we were thinking outside the box and going along, along the lines of a urine test, but it lacks data since it's not able to tell like subsets like triglycerides or any of those, so we decided to move away from that as well. <laughs> so how it works, uh, like I said with theirs, ours do have caps on it because I don't want to actually prick my finger. Sorry, y'all. But uh, so what, it's gonna, what you're going to do is you're going to end up sticking in your finger on its side since there's less nerve endings. You would stick it in, and then you would just kind of like clamp it down really quickly. Just then that's why it's spring loaded. It's going to push it back up, and then after you after you prick your finger, you're just going to set it down on the channel that will be shown on the top layer of the strip. Uh, they're not presently there, but they would be there. And you would just set it down, let the blood collect on those electrodes, and then it, there's going to be a light on the top that's going to signal when the app receives the data. Once it's received the data, you're free to move on, take out the strip, and remove it and just kind of dispose of it how you please. Okay, so to illustrate our device, we used the CAD software, and originally we did it in two separate parts and then created a hinge to connect them. Um, this will allow easy movement, and then we have the strip shown more on the right, and that's gonna have the lancet up towards the top, and then the channels down at the bottom to collect blood. Uh, and then next we're going to have a video showing the movement. So this is how far the hinge can move. It'll move 30 degrees outward and 15 degrees inward from its initial position. Um, and then that's how, that shows how the lancet will move um, in and out securely and quickly. These are our three prototypes we went through. So we started with a clay model to test size and then we moved into 3D printing more. Um, our last model to highlight our main points was we had to sand down the hinges more for, easily, for more easily movement and then um, widen our space for the, land, for the strip. So basically how the channels are gonna work is that when the blood pulls, there's gonna be a, a chemical reaction between the blood and the uh, cholesterol oxidase that's gonna be lining those electrodes and based off the voltage that's produced, it's gonna determine, uh, it's gonna compare that on a base level that we have recorded, it's through research. You compare that based off that and then decide whether the levels are low, high, or in a normal range, and those will be sent to the microcontroller to be sent to the app. Um, 
Um, there are over 3 billion smartphone users in the world, and about half of them have a mobile health app installed in their phone. So this means that mobile health app is um, a useful way to encourage patient self-care. And our app that we developed is different from current cholesterol monitoring apps on the app market because of the multiple features we include in one, to include the ability to sync across multiple devices. Um, we also have all of your cholesterol levels easily available on one screen. And you can also keep track of your weight, your medications, and your diet. And lastly, we've included information on what cholesterol is, why it's important, and our main mission. So compared to current devices that are on the market, we offer several value propositions. The first being that our device can track and record data using temporal logistics. So you can have a weekly, monthly, yearly tracking of your um, lipid levels. Secondly, this device will be able to be used self-monitoring. So you get instant feedback when you're making changes to your lifestyle, such as your diet, if you're increasing carbohydrates, decreasing sugar intake. Um, these things you'll be able to get much faster feedback on whether they're working for your lipid levels. Uh, thirdly, you won't have a need to buy lancets and test strips separately. This will be included into one unified instrument that will fit inside our device. That also makes the disposal much more easier. Some future um, plans for our company is an aggressive social media campaign. Um, many patients and many people in the United States, over 100 million, have hyperlipidemia, but not many are aware of it or, um, frankly, care. And so we're interested in capturing more of that market and showing them the negative risks of coronary artery disease and how they can take a more active role in their own lifestyle and in their health in order to improve their outcomes. Uh, finally, our device could be used uh, for other monitoring, such as glucose monitoring um, or uh, other enzymes. Finally, uh, we're seeking uh, funding for our patent applications as well as seed money for Bentop testing and taking this device into the market space. I'd like to thank you for your attention today and we'd like to field any questions. So I have a question. So uh, yeah, being able to monitor cholesterol uh, is a very important uh, application. Uh, I guess my question, as I want, saw your presentation, is you know there's already uh, an infrastructure or ecosystem built around glucose monitoring. So did you think about just building in a cholesterol monitoring capability to an existing glucose monitoring? Uh, framework uh, where people already, you know, can uh, take finger sticks and get blood samples in that manner, um, uh, rather than making your, a, a separate platform. Right. Well, we were kind of thinking since our device, we wanted to streamline the strip and the Lancet together. It fit better with going with our own separate device. But in the future, I mean, this can be modeled to. The strip can be modeled to have both like a glucose and the cholesterol sensors and can just like we can add on to add on multiple sensors to sense different things so it's all done in one specific spot rather than having to purchase a bunch of different products. There also isn't anything on the market that will consistently track and log your data so that's also something that's unique with this device. I would agree it's more convenient to have the needle on there but can you think of maybe some downsides? Uh, to having a needle and the strip, and if it's a true needle, disposal of that is what I'm referring to. Right, so we were thinking about uh, how to keep it sterile and then how to dispose of it. So ideally, manufacturer-wise, it'd be manufactured uh, sterile in predetermined packages, so one strip would be in its own package with its own sealant, or like a little like, Ziploc seal, right? So it'd be in there, you take it out, and it's still sterile, you use it, and then you could put it back in the material of the bag or the container would be pierce proof and so you could dispose of it in like a bio like a biohazard like the typical disposal method for landsets and paper strips and i don't think we specified really that the strip isn't going to be completely paper it's going to have a plastic underlining so it's going to be stable it's not just going to be loose with a needle hanging off the edge but it, yeah that 
if, if it is a biohazard, you know, that you think about the the way glucose testing, you reuse the lancets, right? You do not. That you do not. It, it, well, it's, it's not recommended, not recommended. by uh, physicians to reuse a lancet for contamination reasons. So patient, glucose patients currently are forced to use a lancet new each time, forced to use a strip each time, uh, gotcha. and they're supposed to be uh, disposing of, of those in biohazard waste and medical sharps waste. Um, I'm sure many are not compliant yeah. with that, but by producing this device where it's two in one, we can increase compliance and make it easier. I guess maybe uh, uh, another question. At the beginning, you mentioned the barrier was the cost for cholesterol monitoring, uh, what, $5 per test or something. Uh, how does your concept improve upon that? So the current cholesterol tests, they're $5 for just the strip that goes into the test, and then the device itself are about $200, a cheap one, maybe $160. Okay. Um, and compared to a glucose sensor, those are nine dollars. Okay. Um, so you can get those in much bigger bulk. So testing cholesterol daily would be very prohibitive using that uh, model system. However, our system isn't going to have an LCD screen. It's going to transmit the data, so we can make the whole device much cheaper, under a hundred dollars, maybe even under fifty dollars. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs> that concludes the presentations. The judges and I are now going to go away to a conference room very quickly. We will be right back to announce the winner. In the meantime, if you all have checked anything out of the um, uh, room, it would be great if you were able to check it all back in. For all of your prototypes and things like that, I would like for your prototype to be put into my office so that way you know where they are and I know where they are as well. So if you get a chance, just put your prototypes in my office and uh, we will be back in just a few minutes.
All right, perfect. Let's gather back in here. Um, uh, our, the judges, my gosh, there was, there was the scoring was tight. So it was very, very difficult. We had a hard time determining the winner of all of these different things. Every one of y'all really had some very innovative characteristics in each one of your devices. Again, as I said, I do hope that many of your teams want to take these devices and your ideas and move those forward. Please get in touch with me. Please help us. We will help you. I will have an incubator space completely in Zachary. We'll put you in touch with all kinds of resources to get you going with this and we will help you develop and continue to develop your devices. So, you're tired of hearing about from me all weekend long, so what we're going to do is we're going to announce um, the winners. So I'm going to announce the third place winner first and then we'll go to the second and the first. And the third place winner is Data MD. And the checks are not cashable. <laughs> I, have to, I would like them back. Um, the money will be deposited in your student accounts. Oh. <clears throat> Daddy, one, two, three. And those of you who are not A&M students, Thank they'll you. still be deposited in your, your accounts before you leave. We'll get that process very quickly, OK? What? All right, and the second place team is Team Lift. Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, smooth transition. That's right. All right. Congratulations. Well, you can, you can keep it if you want for pictures yeah, for a while. Oh, yeah, definitely. You're yeah, welcome yeah, to keep yeah, it for yeah. Just don't walk out of the room with it, all right? Okay. Um, again, thank you all very much for the weekend. It's been a great deal of fun. I've enjoyed working with each one of you. However we can help you in the future, please, uh, please work with us. Uh, please turn in all the material and things like that. Help us clean up a bit. But we really appreciate all the time and effort, and I'm hoping you've gotten as much out of this as we have. The first place team for the Aggies event this weekend, focusing on medical devices, is Sonocentesis. I still don't like needles. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, all two hours of it. And uh, you'll have a great rest of the time here. If there's anything we can help you, please let us know.